So it's my pleasure to open up the second annual Julia Schwartz Lecture. Those of you who were here last year knew we, know we launched the series with a talk by Neil Gaiman, uh, which I think was a really exciting experience for all of us here. This series was launched thanks to gifts of friends of Julia Schwartz. Julia Schwartz was a longtime science fiction fan, one of the first agents in fandom, uh, the, the, one of the first agents to represent specifically science fiction writers, one of the founders of Worldcon, uh, one of the fathers of the Silver Age at DC Comics, uh, an extraordinary person. And I, if you've enjoyed any of the DC stories of the last 50 years, I think you have benefited from the creative imagination that Julia Schwartz brought to the table. So we've launched the series as a way of paying tribute to Schwartz and to bring top flight genre creators to the MIT campus to engage in thoughtful conversations about science fiction, about comics, about popular culture more generally, um, which in a way that we think really reflects the excitement that MIT community has long had around those genres. MIT is the right place to be having a regular tribute to, to Schwartz. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, and I'm going to keep the introductions brief because I'm planning to grill him extensively about a, the whole body <laughs> of work that he's been involved with. Uh, but again, you know, you probably, if you're like me, was enjoy or were enjoying the work of J. Michael Straczynski well before you knew who he was, that he was involved in writing He-Man and Real Ghostbusters, The New Twilight Zone, uh, Murder, She Wrote, uh, Babylon 5, uh, Crusades, Jeremiah, and comics. He's been shaping the career lately of Thor, of Spider-Man. Uh, he's done originate, originated series like Rising Stars and The Twelve, which is up for an Eisner Award this year. He's now, you know, he's also been involved as a screenwriter, most recently Changeling, and he's got a whole suite of other projects uh, in the pipeline that we're going to be talking some about later in the program tonight. So that, I, to my money, he's one of the most imaginative, visionary, far-reaching creators in the space of science fiction and fan fantasy and comics working today. So it's exciting. I'm really excited. The fanboy in me is enormously thrilled to be sharing, <laughs> sharing the stage with uh, JMS and hope uh, we'll have a good discussion and gradually we'll open up to the floor for your questions as well. So with that said, let me turn the floor over to JMS. I was, I was told this was a seminar for top flight creators, but none of them could make it, so we were, <laughs> we're kind of stuck with me. Um, as a disclaimer, I am more comfortable with giving you know, informal talks and answering questions and inter you know, interacting with you guys than I am giving a formal talk. I suck at these. <laughs> Particularly when I have to come to a place like MIT, where everyone in the room is smarter than I am by several <laughs> orders of magnitude. Uh, guys who can do chi-square analysis in their heads, you know, it's just, and I tried to find, you know, a couple of jokes about engineering students, but I'm not that fucking funny, you know? <laughs> Two engineering students walk into a bar, so it's Monday, you know? So <laughs> what's your point? And in coming up with a topic to discuss, uh, I could tell them ways to succeed, ways they can get on with their lives and do great things. No, I'm gonna talk about failure instead. And, and getting in touch with your inner failure. And the, 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 the uh, topic being called, uh, it's never too late to fail. <laughs> See, the military has this point of view that you have to do something over and over again until you fail at it. If you don't fail at it, you're not doing it right. Because that's how you learn where the wall is. And once you find where that wall is, you learn how to adapt and change and get over the wall. If you don't fail to get over it, learn. And this applies to life as well, I think. And to, studies into work and to careers and to television. If you don't fail once in a while, you're not doing it right. There's a sort of box that we all carve for ourselves, the things we know we can do, that we're safe at. And we tend to stay in the box, because to go outside the box is scary. You could fail. And that's terrible. 
The idea of failing is ingested in all of us as being something much to avoid. And it's, it's really wrong. You have to embrace the idea of failure. I mean, granted, you can't fail all the time <laughs> and achieve anything, unless your dad was a president or something. I mean, you know. <laughs> But it, it holds you back. I get, when I was at San Diego State University, a much smaller IQ school than <laughs> MIT, by several orders of magnitude, um, I used to work at the Daily Aztec, a paper there. And there was this young woman who worked there as well for a semester before she went off to a better school. And she was stunning. I mean, just blonde, lithe, attractive, just, you know, if Lee Harvey Oswald had seen her through the eyesight of that, you know, gun, it would have burned his eyes out, it would be in a better world today, okay, that, <laughs> that's what we're talking about here, right? And after about a month, she began going out with the photographer at the Daily Aztec. And it wasn't that he was scuzzy, but you had to peel off levels of awfulness to get to the scuzzy. <laughs> I didn't even bathe, you know. And so, and one, one thing I, after I got, uh, toward the end of the semester, I asked him, why are you going out with her? And th I'm not making up his reply. This is his actual honest-to-God words. His whole, as deep as he went, was, I like blonde pubes. That was his only answer. <laughs> so I asked her um, a week later, <laughs> almost afraid of the answer at this point, why are you going out with him? She said, well, nobody else asked me because they were all too intimidated, I guess. Especially you, she said. <laughs> and, you know, because we were all afraid of failure. We're all afraid of asking her out and being told, get a life, you know. But uh, during the 70s, and the 70s skews the data enormously, by the way, <laughs> there was a, um, a study done where uh, a guy would go up to a woman just casually, a psychology department experiment, and say, listen, I've, I've seen you on campus before, I think you're very attractive, we get along, do you want to go to bed? And nine times out of 10, they would get slapped or she'd walk away. One time out of 10, it was the 70s, <laughs> she would say yes. But you had to be willing to put up with the nine slaps. But when you learn that suddenly, it's shit, that ups my ante enormously. You know? <laughs> but you know, I, was, I was always, at risk of diverging from the topic at the moment, failure, well, failure in women and women to me are a pretty good combination. Um, I was clueless about women. I had no frickin' idea. Um, I was at a Farrell's ice cream parlor with a woman I was dating at the time. I was like 22, 23. And this woman walks by, very softly, very well built. And my lady I was with says, um, nice tits. And I said, I didn't know you noticed. <coughs> And she said, well, I like women too. So, well, it's good that you're open-minded in terms of being not competitive with other women. And I wrote, no, idiot. <laughs> I like, oh. <laughs> uh, just, it's, it's Joe Luck, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you. But to get back to the topic, we're, we're afraid of failure. And the problem is we have to wake up in our own lives. We tend to fall asleep in our lives. And we do the same thing today as yesterday and the day to follow. And every so often you have to jolt yourself awake and do things that really scare you because you have to ask yourself, is this the life you were promised? Is this the life you expected? When you were 12 years old and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? Is this it? Are you there or are you on your way to get there? Either way, you must, again, confront the possibility of failure if you want to achieve the goal of getting there, which is why, incidentally, a lot of folks I know who say they want to be writers, for instance, they work on a screenplay or a novel or a book or whatever it is, short story, for years, and they never finish it. And there's a reason why they never finish it, because when it's done, they can be judged. While it's in process, they can't be judged. Well, it's a work in progress. So they, you know, for those folks in the audience who want to be writers, that's probably one of your reasons for not finishing what, what you're doing. And, you know, me, I, I, I always knew I was going to be a writer from this high. And the odds were very much against me ever getting here because 
I come from a lower and middle class, upper lower class, blue collar background. My first 17 years, we moved 21 times. So I was always a new kid. And, but whenever, you know, from this height on, I said, well, when you grow up, what do you want to be? A writer. Written anything yet? I'm not ready yet. <laughs> and I took four years of typing and, and just, you know, I, I, I always knew it. There was one brief window where I almost became something else where I thought I wanted to be an artist. I was about six. <laughs> and I was living with my grandmother for a while, who had a boarder who lived in the basement, uh, named Panarafo Rofaisky. Panarafo, pan is a form of uh, respect, I mean, Mr. or Sir. And he was a boarder. We to I was told he was a boarder. What really went on, who knows? Um, she, was, she was widowed, so there was, you know, anything could be going on. And Panarafo was a painter, a really good landscape and portrait painter. And he had been assigned a commission, very expensive, to do this one great landscape. He put months working on it. And I would watch him work. I'm sitting up in an old chair. And he finished it up and was going to go get to my grandmother to show her his finished work. So he goes off. I'm looking at the painting. It needs something. <laughs> what does it need? It needs a kitty. So I get the brush. And I dip it into black ink, and I am up there painting a cat. <laughs> Panarafa comes back to my grandmother and tells us, and stops seeing this. My grandmother begins using terms I'd never heard before to that point. <laughs> half in Russian, half in English. It was scary. And Panarafa says, no, 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 stop, stop. And he steps back, looks at the painting for a minute, and says, you know, he's right. It needed a cat. <laughs> and he said, this one's for me. He puts it on the shelf and says, I will begin again. But this is my painting now. And I was impressed, even at six, with what a man that was. Also the first person who ever died. I couldn't quite understand that when I went to the funeral. I said, Panarofo, come on, let's go. It's, you know, stuff going on. But he lived a life that he wanted to live. He had fun doing what he did. And he showed me at that time the passion of art. And for me as a kid, that's very important because no one growing up believed I was ever going to be a writer. Because where I came from, the street, I come from nowhere and nothing. Patterson, New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey, 37 miles of universal fart, just awful environments. <laughs> and kids in my neighborhood didn't become writers. You grew up working in a gas station, you know, or the garage, or you worked in a supermarket. And in some ways, when they, people say to you around you, don't do this because they don't want you to fail. They say, you know, if you do this, you're going to disappoint yourself, you're going to get hurt, it's not going to work out. I'm trying to protect you. They're more protecting themselves. Because if you follow your dreams and achieve them, then they have to say to themselves, what didn't I do? And why didn't I do it? And that's a harder thing for them to accept. You have to do what scares you. It's important. It's necessary, even though, and especially though, you may fail at it. When I was back at San Diego State, again, keep myself college related for the audience, um, I took a course in science fiction writing from Elizabeth Chater. And I was terrified of public speaking, still am, by the way. And she said, you have to read one of your stories in front of the class as part of your grade. And I was terrified. I was just absolutely beside myself. And it came the day I wrote the shortest story imaginable. If I could have had, you know, a title and a period, that would have been fine. You know. <laughs> it's Art Nouveau. Um, it's experimental fiction. It's called Dot. You know. <laughs> I, would have, I would have done it if I could. And I began reading the short story, and I got faster and faster and even more incomprehensible than I am right now, and sweating and turning pink and people saying louder from the back of the room. And halfway through, Mrs. Chater said, that's enough, you can stop now. It's like the worst thing you could possibly do to somebody. <laughs> and I thought, this, this cannot stand. I can't keep doing this. So this, I, I now know what scares me. Therefore, I now have to do it. So I signed up that, that semester to do um, uh, orientation classes, where I had to sort of walk, or there's counseling, pardon me, to walk 30 or 40 students at a time through the campus, projecting in a big open space, and give them for six hours every day a talk about the university. Threw up every day for weeks, <laughs> but did it. Not in spite of the fact that it scared me, but because it scared me. Because I knew that this is something I was, I was outside my, my box, if you will. 
And we all try to find lives where courage isn't necessary. There's only one problem with that. It's not possible. Once upon a time, courage was going out and hunting bear and bison and other people. Um, now it's you know, yelling at your boss. It's having the courage to stand up for what you believe in. Um, when I was, again, at San Diego State, um, I was taking a class in writing. I took a lot of classes in writing to prepare myself. And I was getting all A's. But this one instructor who was difficult, shall we say, with women. He had a problem with women. And one day he was uh, dressing down this one female student, just an abusive, offensive, out of, out of line kind of way. And from the back of the room came, leave her the fuck alone. And I was surprised to see that it was me. <laughs> Out. And we had words. And uh, I, he tried to bounce me out of the school. And they said, look, privately, we know this guy has a problem. So, you know, we're going to let it go. But my grades all went down to D suddenly. So I see the class over the course of the semester. And in the semester, he said, you know, you're, you're never going to be a writer. Now, the temperament for it, Mr. Straczynski. And making him say Mr. Straczynski was half of the revenge for me because <laughs> even I can't say about blowing out an incisor, you know? Um, and so when I, after I graduated, I began sending him articles. <laughs> Short stories, plays, whatever I published, I sent him a copy. After a while, I'll collect. And I heard finally that he passed away. And that's true. This, I'm very sorry to hear that. And where, where was the funeral held? And he told me, and I went there. And I had one more article. I wrapped it around a pencil and shoved it into the ground at his burial place. I was thinking of vampire. <laughs> Not that I hold the grudge. I've, you know, I, another story, and part of the, the divergence in the stories I'm trying to find ones I haven't told before. Um, again, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. At San Diego State, there was a professor named Norman Corwin, who was a visiting lecturer. And those, anyone here know Norman's work? Some of you do, a couple of you do. Three, the like sound of one fan clapping. Um, <laughs> I, this is a guy who wrote a cantata for the UN on human rights, who was bigger in the radio age than Orson Welles and Arch Older put together who was one of our, our nation's finest writers, who got gray listed in the 50s, and his career went off the edge. But he was, he was a writer's writer. Guys who learned from him were like Rod Serling and, and, and Ray Bradbury and, and, Nor and uh, uh, Walter Cronkite and, and Edward R. Murrow. These are guys who said, we're Norman's kids. We learned from Norman. So when I saw, I wanted in his class, desperately. One slight problem. He was in the telecommunications and film department. I was in the psychology department. I got my first degree in psychology, second in sociology so I could not be unemployed in two different areas at the same time. <laughs> and I wanted in, but you only you had to be in the department to get the computer control cards. Back then there were control cards, you had card punches, you know, and, and you had to get my hands on them at the beginning of the department, but I wasn't. So, shit, what am I gonna do? So I broke in, <laughs> thinking stupidly that if I got the cards, nobody would, would question it, nobody would notice. So I got the cards and I dropped them into the admissions office and showed up the first day of class, no one had called me on it, and I also had to submit, by the way, a sample of my writing to Norman to read. So the first day of class, I'm sitting there like you are right now, just proud of myself, and up comes this leonine, dignified figure at the door. Is, is there a Joe Straczynski here? Can I see you outside, please? <laughs> so we go outside into the hall, I understand you aren't actually entitled to be in this class. I said, that's correct. How did you get the cards? Well, the, the, the back door doesn't lock really well. <laughs> and he was fighting a smile during this whole conversation. He said, why did you do that? I said, I've seen your resume, sir. I, I want to learn from you. He says, well, they all want me to kick you out of here. Out of the university, if at all possible. <laughs> um, but he said, I, I, you know, I read your writing, and it's, it's really quite good. And could you stay and help me with the other students? <laughs> <laughs> Shh. 
sure, I can do that. <laughs> and I, I, if I had not risked the failure of being A, caught out, be expelled, you know, <laughs> see it not working, Norman, if there's an icon in my life that taught me what it is to be a writer and taught me how to write, it's Norman. I wouldn't be standing here today if I hadn't learned certain things from Norman about how to write. And the, the odds of failure in his were huge, but you have to do it. And, and this is why, again, I go back to the notion of you have to do things that are risky. You have to take chances. You have to be willing to fail and make decisions that will often come back to haunt you later on, but they're the right decision at that time. Um, when I was working on a show called Jace and the Wheeled Warriors, <sighs> I have to go lie down now. Um, <laughs> I got called in by the French head of the um, company to say that they had just been picked up a show called The Real Ghostbusters based on the movie. And I have only done science fiction and action shows at this point, and uh, never any comedy. And Jean, in his thick accent, says to me, I speak to ABC, to Jenny and Amy, I tell them you are the funny man. <laughs> <laughs> Do not make for me the liar. <laughs> and that I want the job. I've never written comedy before, ever. What's the worst going to happen? I'll fail. They can't kill you. They can't eat you. They can't put you in TV jail. Because <laughs> it was full. <laughs> and that show, anyone who knows that show, ended up being very popular, won an Emmy, and all of a sudden I became more visible suddenly than I had been before by virtue of winning to say, I don't know, but I'm going to take a chance. Now, if you know you can't do it and you lie, that's different. And then, you're, then you're a producer. <laughs> but give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Um, when I worked on Captain Power, another TV show that came into this season and, and said, the toy company wants to have more input into the show next year and they want you to stay on. I said, Morally, I can't do that. I have to make the decision that I can't let the toy company have that much say. I said, if you do that, you know, you'll lose your first live action show. When you walk off of this, you'll never work on another show again. I said, well, I got to do what I got to do. And I opted for failure and ended up from there working on Twilight Zone. Because <laughs> they heard that this guy stands up for storytelling, which is how I got into that show in the first place. Word kind of got around town. Um, Babylon 5. A, a story that was done in a five-year arc, the first one to do it. One well, of the first shows to shoot in widescreen, the first to use CGI on a, on a regular basis in television, first with kind of foreshadowing on a novel structure that we used that no one had ever used in America before. Our chances of failure were breathtaking. <laughs> I was excited by that. I can fail all over the place now. <laughs> and oddly enough, it worked. You, you have to push yourself past where you are. You have to embrace the possibility of failure. You have to look out and see where that line is. Because most people never see it, and they don't know that it's there. But they live in that constraint. They live in the box. And only by pushing yourself to failure can you discover where it is and adjust yourself and take a chance. Whether that's moving somewhere else, taking a different job, asking someone out on a date, with or without blonde pubes, it, you know, it, we, we are put here to be magical. We are put here to do extraordinary things. Where you are may or may not be where you want to be. And if it's not, try and get there. You may not get all the way there, but you get halfway there, and you're half as, half as happier as you would have been had you gotten all the way. You have to be fearless, which is, I guess, courage more. That's, that's what it says, courage more. Um, and when I finished working in television on Jeremiah, well, I was a journalist for many years. Gave that up after a while. Was in television for a number of years, worked 20 years. Did that. What else can I fail at? What haven't I done? Well, I've never written a movie. I've written television movies, but never a real honest to God, no kidding feature film. And, well, this is a chance to fail spectacularly. <laughs> so I spent a year researching a story that I'd heard about years before and wrote a screenplay called Changeling, which I sent to my agent, unaware as it was coming in. I just landed on his desk one morning. And I never expected anything to come out of it. I figured, you know, it's going to flop and not go anywhere because 
The point was the doing, not the result. And it went a week later to Ron Howard, who bought it, <laughs> and to Angelina Jolie, who read the star in it, and then to Clint Eastwood, who directed it. And suddenly, I've gone from Mr. TV guy to Mr. A-list film writer <laughs> overnight. And nobody knew who the hell I was. <laughs> that was the best part of it, you know? I, 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 honestly, I, I, I risk being self-indulgent. This is what the person actually said to me. I, I have all these meetings afterwards with studio heads. And one of them said, who the hell are you? <laughs> Where would you come from? And how did you learn to, to learn how to write like this? You know? And the cool thing, by the way, for those who are nascent writers in the audience, not one of them cared how old I was. They didn't care if I was 20 or 60. It was all the words on the page. And, and that's key to, I think, hope for those who want to be writers in this area, that in the end, it's the work that counts. So it doesn't matter if you come from a good school, a bad school, a grand school like MIT. Uh, it's all down to the quality of your storytelling and the, quanti and the quality of your words. And since changing, I've kept on with the process of risking failure, because it's fun after a while. <laughs> the Wachowski brothers are friends of mine. Woo! I get around. Um, <laughs> and they called me one day on a Monday. I said, we have a project that's six weeks away from camera. Uh, we need your help. Can you come out and see us? So we went down to Warner Brothers to say hi to them. And they said, we have a script, needs to be rewritten, stem to stern, page one rewrite. Uh, and we're, again, six weeks off from camera. So, okay, how, when do you have to have it? Whole new script. I said, well, it has to go out to actors on Friday. <laughs> this was Tuesday. <laughs> Can you do it? <sighs> And there's that moment when, you know, everything sucks up inside of you, and if you had a sphincter, it's gone, you know? Um, and I said, sure, I'll do it. And I went home, and in 53 hours, two hours of sleep a day for three days, I turned the script around. And they shot the son of a bitch without notes. It's called Ninja Assassin, and it comes out in November with uh, Rain, the Korean pop star, is one of the, the stars. And since I've been working since then with Tom Hanks and Tom Cruise and Ron Howard and Jim Cameron and Steven Spielberg and all these guys. And it's because I was, I was open to fail. I was open to failure. And I remember sitting at, the, at Cannes. Cannes was amazing. I'm there with, with Clint and the gang and... and All right, I, I know how it sounds, all right? <laughs> Me and Angie hanging out with Brad, dude. Um, and the best part, before I get to that part, was we have the premiere, and there's like 16 black cars lined up, all right? And there's French police having their picture taken with Clint because, you know, it's Clint Eastwood. Yeah. <laughs> and they drive us to the streets of the south of France, you know, running lights and sirens. Normally when the cops are behind me, lights and sirens is a bad thing, you know? And, 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 and going out to this thing, and afterward I was sitting on the beach in the south of France thinking, I've woken up in someone else's life. Because I'm just a kid from Jersey. And that's the extraordinary thing about taking chances. You get to live forever. When I was a kid, this is the last story. Um, You're relieved. Um, there was death all around me. My, my, I come from a Russian family where death was a motif. <laughs> my grandmother loved death. She would go to funerals for people she didn't even know. I swear to God. And then the reception afterward, I complained about the food. This is the kind of... <laughs> they would bring me to funerals of other kids who misbehaved. I'd say, see? See? Yeah. <laughs> Before I was born, there was a brother born, um, Joseph Michael, who, the, you know, the name was a compromise solution to relatives who wanted the right name, and my, the brother passed away in childbirth, and they recycled the name. <laughs> and one day I was brought to my mom, I was like this big, you know, to the cemetery, and there's my name. I just got 
out of here. <laughs> and and I, I realized very young, I have to become immortal. I have to live forever somehow. And, and to do that, I realized in, in a child's thought, I have to leave the planet. I have to get off the gravity well. I got to somehow get into space, because somehow in space things live forever. That was my idea. So stage one of the rocket was journalism. And I, that carried me a long way, 10 years. The LA Times, Time Incorporated, the Herald Examiner, many other magazines, national publications. And it carried me about that far, we had to circle back toward the ground again. So I lit up stage two, television. And that carried me even further. Babylon 5, Murder, Sure, Road, Jake and the Fat Man. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> My TV guy log line, Jake and the Fat Man, was he can't walk, he can't act, together they fight crime. <laughs> After Babylon 5, you know, Crusade kind of petered out, and Jeremiah was just a nightmare from start to finish, and the rocket began to go down. I thought, I have, I'm now 50 years old, three years ago, <laughs> four years ago, <laughs> almost five. <laughs> I have 50s. And I may have one last stage left in me, but at this age, you don't know if it's going to work or not, or if it'll even you know, ignite, or it'll take me anywhere. So I thought, well, take a chance. So I lit up stage three with Changeling. And I held on, and this was rocking and shaking like a son of a bitch. And I closed my eyes, and I can see the curve of the earth. And I am weightless. That's a damn good place to be. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I yeah, I'd go. Oh. <laughs> so I, I, I should note that Norman Corwin just celebrated his 99th birthday last month. So he's still teaching at USC and uh, still inspiring students. Norman's still teaching, still traveling the country, still writing. And um, his dad lived to be 105. <laughs> and would call him up every day make sure he was keeping busy. <laughs> um, Norman, if, if, when you go home, go online and check out normancorwin.com. The eloquence and the use of language is stunning. Ray Bradbury admitted when he first started out writing poetry, he was trying to do Norman. Uh, and Rod Serling said when he first started writing, he was imitating Norman Corwin's voice. Um, there are writers who understand language as no one else does, and Norman is one of those. There's a documentary that came out about him a couple of years ago that won an Oscar, as a matter of fact. And do, do check it out. Um, I and a lot of other writers learned from him and became what we are today. And I just, I cannot credit him enough. I would not be as good a writer as I am or as decent a person as I think I am uh, had it not been for Norman. He's an ama amazing guy. Amazing guy. So, Rod Serling, he was another person you just mentioned. And yeah. you worked on the new Twilight Zone. Yes. Any thoughts about Serling, his, his long-term contributions? And well, Serling, I, I, he doesn't require validation from me. <clears throat> um, Whenever I get too cocky with my own writing, I pull down a, Norman, uh, a Rod Serling script, read it, and then I go kill myself. You know, <laughs> because it's just so uh, astonishing. There's a weird link, by the way, with me and Rod. Um, when I was a, a student at Southwestern College, uh, I was there on a Saturday. Um, I'll go back before that. On, I wasn't at, at college as a student. I was there as a high school student. Every year, the, the high school was in the area. I was going to Chula Vista High School would have career day. And they would bring the best athletes, the best dancers, the best singers, the best writers, if they had to, um, to the Southwestern College for career day to show what these different people could do. And they had you know, all the writers as far away from civilized company as possible. They shoved us off in a building by ourselves. This is like 71, 72. And I'm sitting there, my short story's in front of me, and like no one's coming by. You know, because who wants to sit there and read a story on a hot summer day? And this gentleman comes in wearing corduroy blazer and, and slacks, um, sort of a um, salt and pepper, well, that's better. <laughs> Voice of God suddenly appeared. Um, salt and pepper hair. Was this on during the thing at all, by the way? 
I can start over. <laughs> Did the guys in the back hear me okay earlier? The first time was all right? That's the only thing they leaving unsatisfied, which is usually what happens, like my relationships are that way. <laughs> leaving unsatisfied. It's like, thank you. So um, anyway, this gentleman comes in and walks down the line of tables and comes to my table and picks up one of my short stories, a science fiction horror story, big, big, you know, jump there, you know. <laughs> sits down in a lawn chair, reads it, comes back, only like six, seven pages long. Picks up another one, reads, sits down, comes back and looks at me for a long time and says, you have a great and abiding talent for someone of your age. I have two notes for you. First, cut every third adjective. <laughs> which I am still working on, by the way. <laughs> Second, never let him stop you from writing the story you want to write. And leaves. The advisor over there comes like a rocket sled. <laughs> <You know. laughs> what did he say? And I told her what he said. He looked kind of, don't you know who that was? I said, no, that's Rod Serling. He's here to talk today at the, at the, univers at the college. I'm out the door. <laughs> <laughs> and he, it's like two minutes, he's gone. Like a fucking apparition, just gone. <laughs> and, I, and I couldn't even afford to buy a ticket, you know. And my first validation, you know. So years later, I'm working on the new Twilight Zone. And I said, we found an outline by Rod for an episode that he never put in the script form. Would you like to collaborate posthumously to Mr. Serling? Yeah. <laughs> So I wrote the episode, Our Selena is Dying, and I tried really hard to recreate Rod's voice, because he had a very distinctive voice. And after it aired, I got a letter from Carol Serling, his widow, uh, to say that she watched the episode and it was as if Rod had written it. And of all of the, the, the correspondence I've received over the years, that's the only one I have framed in my office. That one means the most to me. And when I finished up working on The Zone, I always buy a gift for myself to remember some particular project. There was an Art Deco store called Piccolo Pete's in the Valley. Watches Art Deco stuff, beautiful stuff, gone now. And I went in and they had one of the um, uh, Hamilton Ventura watches that came out in the 50s, which they were about to reissue, but this was one of the originals. So I said, I want one of those. So he's wrapping it up for me. And um, he said, I just got one of these recently. And the last one I had was years and years and years and years and years ago. And, and what do you do, by the way? So I'm a writer. He said, wait, the last one I had, I sold to a writer. Really, who was that? Rod Serling. <laughs> <laughs> and later on, they asked me to do an introduction to some of Rod's stuff for um, Gauntlet Press. So uh, he's been a, a constant uh, factor in my life over the years. And again, I, just, I, 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 I'm, I love language. I love taking words and slamming them together in whole new ways and seeing what happens, what kind of explosions you get as a result. And, and Rod was a master of that. And if you learn from Rod and you learn from Norman and you learn from Harlan Ellison, you actually acquire those skills in your toolbox. This is all about acquiring tools. Writing, artistry, whatever it is you're working on, it's all about acquiring tools as you go along. Because if you only have a hammer, every problem is a nail. So the more tools you have, the more things you can build with them. So I learned a lot of, of things from Norman. I got lots of tools from Rod and tools from, from Harlan. And now I can make a bookshelf. Very good. So we know from your stories that you were a painter as a child. Were you also a reader? And if so, what, how did you get interested in science fiction and comics? I, I've, I've always been a comics story. Comics taught me how to read. Um, uh, I grew up reading science fiction stories, but before then comics, because going to a different, different school every six months, you kind of fall between the cracks of the curriculum. Um, and so I, comics taught me how to read. They taught me my moral center. Um, which is a silly thing to say, but it's also absolutely true. Um, I'll come back to Superman in a second. Remind me if I forget. Superman. Um, and my aunt, I used to go, my, my, my parents were not the best parents in the world, so they would shut me off to my aunt and my grandmother. And my aunt knew I loved comics, so she would, in the in-between times, just load up with comics to keep me busy while I was there, because I was always a pain in the ass. And so I would come into my aunt, and there would be a stack like, I'm this high and the comics were this high. You know. I would just dive in. You know, and you wouldn't see me for days. I would just read them, then I'd start from the, start, the beginning again, read them again, and absorb the words. And that was sort of my first dalliance with learning that, oh, but people make these things, don't they? That your writers write on these things. Um, I mentioned that, that my, my values 
and my morality, <laughs> what there is of it, <clears throat> uh, comes from comic books. When I was at uh, Comic-Con in Chicago a number of years ago, I was in the dealer's room and browsing. It, you've seen the dealer's room. Those comics fans are huge. They just go on you know, for, for galactic measures. And rows and rows of tables. And I'm at one end, and I hear a commotion from the far end of somebody like, stop him, stop him, stop him. And a guy, young guy, 20s, you know, um, comes running this way. He just stolen some stuff, very expensive stuff from the guy's booth. And of course, the crowd parts like the Red Sea. You know, nothing, <laughs> nothing to do with it. And it comes in my direction, and I just tackle the motherfucker. You know? <laughs> um, like a gazelle, I bring him down. <laughs> and me and, and the guy hold him you know, for, the, for the cops. Uh, and the convention organizer comes up and says, why, why, why did you do that? You could have been hurt. You know? And I said, the first I was just the guy on the ground, you know, the guy who made Babylon 5 just captured you. He's like, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I said, so I tell the organizer of the con, look where I'm standing, where I was standing when all this happened. I'm below a, a 10 foot tall Superman cutout. <laughs> <laughs> How could I stand here in front of him? <laughs> And do nothing. You know, you, you have to. It's just that's just those are the rules. You know, I learned the rules from comics. So speaking of the rules, you worked for He-Man, which was, uh, <laughs> you know, which was. You know, even in prison, you get time off for good behavior. So at the time, He-Man was being what I ever do to you? Criticized <laughs> by uh, child advocates for being half an hour commercial for a toy line. Yes. But odds are that a lot of people in this audience grew up on He-Man and remember it fondly to the present day. So there had to have been a, a kind of relationship. How did you how did you think about how did you think about the relationship of commerce and creativity? Uh, how do people working on He-Man think about the tension between <sighs> those two goals? It's like a Nazi hunter and a Nazi, you know? <laughs> <laughs> which is which I'll leave to you. Um, yeah, I remember being in a toy store with my friend at the time, Larry Dottilio, who also worked on the show. And it was just He-Man merchandise as far as the eye could see. And kids yanking their moms saying, buy me this, buy me this, buy me this. And I said to Larry, if they knew who we were, they would kill us on sight. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a driven by a toy company who, who financed it, but you can, as, as I said in Sopranos, you can live on the good side of that, you know, <laughs> and you can find ways to tell stories that are decent within the parameters of that, as long as you don't sell out in the process. Um, and yeah, the patrons of the arts have been around for a long time, I mean, some of the best works of, of all time were commissioned by popes and by kings and queens and rooks and bishops, um, <laughs> a few aces along the way. And so you know, that there was a patron involved, uh, a fantasy only to a certain point. Um, it's when it gets in the way, or I have to sort of take what I've done and bastardize it that I, I draw a line. When I was working on Ghostbusters, um, there was a point where after the first season of that show, which was ABC's number one show, huge ratings, great reviews, they had to fix it suddenly. So they brought in experts, <laughs> child psychologists, who didn't understand that I have a degree in psychology and could argue with them. <laughs> and so they began giving us advice. For instance, make Janine, the character from the Ghostbusters movie, uh, more mommy-like. Make her less strong, more nurturing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and lose the pointy glasses because children are frightened of sharp objects. <laughs> really, said I. Show me your research on that. It's our professional opinion. I don't care what your opinion is. Show me your research. Show me your data. Show me your homework. And they couldn't, of course. And then they said all the characters should have their own distinct roles in the show. So Janine is the mommy. Um, Ray is the hands, uh, Peter is the mouth, Egon is the brains, and Winston, the black character, is the driver. Oh. 
I'll tell you what, said I. Let's, you may go into a, a, a bar downtown in South Central. <laughs> <laughs> and you repeat what you, you said to me. <laughs> and if they let you walk out of there alive, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, finally, if you do these things, I have to leave the show. Because it's, it's, it's immoral. It's wrong. And he said, oh, no, it's a top ten show. You don't walk up. Wrong. I have very few rules. One is I don't lie, I don't bullshit, and I never, ever bluff. And they did it, and I walked. And the next season came out with other diverse hands on it. And it went in the toilet. And halfway through, they said, we're in trouble. So, <laughs> really, says I. Tell, <laughs> tell surprise. <laughs> And they said, you know, can you come back and help us out I said, on one condition? I write the shows the way I want to, with the characters as they were before, period. And, and the junior Ghostbusters, I'm running a truck over them. They aren't going to appear in my shows. And they said yes. So one of the first things I wrote was an episode called um, uh, Jane, You've Changed, <laughs> which starts off with her in the new look. And she realized that she's been falling prey, prey to pressure from people around her and her own self-doubt. <laughs> <laughs> and it keeps changing form through the whole episode, back and forth to different things, and ends up finally as she used to be. <laughs> Accepting herself as she is, rather than trying to make other people happy. They were pissed at that one. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I love working in television. Here's why I love working in television, all right? You got to work with me on this. No, no, no prior preparations with anybody in this room. I will say nine words. And when I finish those nine words, some people in the audience will begin spontaneously breaking out in song. <laughs> and others will join them. And so the whole audience will be singing and bursting out in applause at the end. Just sit right back on your hair, a tail. <laughs> well, yeah. This is a free hour tour. A free hour tour. The tiny ship is the courage of the fair. Let's prove that Minnow would be lost. Come on! You gotta get organized. <laughs> but the fact that you know those lyrics, most of you, those who weren't afraid of failure to come out and sing, is, is why you work in television. Because I, I can't remember how to do a, 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 a co analysis of variance or, or Kai Square, but I know the Gilgit's Island theme song backwards and forwards. <laughs> Except season two, where it's the professor and you know, Marianne versus, you know, anyway, yes. So one of, my and the rest. one of my favorite moments in Babylon 5 was Garibaldi's fascination with Duck Dodgers, which suggests <laughs> that, and it's, it's one of those moments that suggests that pop culture today will survive hundreds of years into the future. So I wondered what- You've got to get out more. <laughs> so I'm wondering what, for, what aspects of our popular culture today you think will be around in the 23rd, 24th century? The stuff that the critics call popular crap. Um, when Mark Twain was, was at the height of his skills, uh, the critics, as, as a rule, didn't like him much. And there were other writers around him who were considered to be much better literary writers. But they've all gone to dust, and most of them are forgotten. Uh, but Mark Twain lives on. Um, Stephen King will be read 100 years from now. Um, against your will sometimes, but you'll read it <laughs> in literary class. Um, I think that, 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 which, that which speaks to the human condition will be remembered and will live on. Um, that which has some element of truth to it will live on. Um, fiction is best when it reflects the personality of the person creating it. Um, Mark Twain said that we all contain within us the same fears and envies and hopes and ambitions and love as everyone else on the planet. So if you write something that is right for you, the odds are it'll reflect in somebody else's eyes. And that kind of fiction, that kind of entertainment, that kind of media will live on. That which is done 
to be literary, that which is done to make writing groups happy or critics happy, um, that will fall by the wayside. And Babylon 5. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of Babylon 5, uh, one of the things that really impressed me at the time was the construction of the alien. The previous science fiction shows, each race seemed to have a single personality. Vulcans were, were stoic, Klingons were warlike, but you represented multiple people from the same planet, and the alien cultures have as much complexity as the human cultures. So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the breakthrough that you, you made in thinking about aliens for Babylon 5. <laughs> Um, I, I, I don't believe in monolithic cultures, that, that we all believe the same things. And there's no reason to keep that tendency just to our, ourselves, uh, that there would be disagreements among alien cultures as well. That the notion that they're all one is, is you know, to fall into established cliche, which is not to say you can't have like a hive mind, which it's all controlled from the top, um, like the White House a few years ago, um, <laughs> which that can happen on occasion. But you get more interesting things happening if you treat them you know, as, as, as unique individuals and themselves. Um, in, in terms of creating those, those cultures and races, I, I kind of peeled off parts of myself. Um, there's a lot of me in Jakar. Um, there's more of me than should be in Londo. Uh, <laughs> I wish I was as good as Delenn, but I'm not. Um, there's not much of Sheridan in me. I, 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 that, was a, that was always the hardest character to write. The human character of, of, of your main lead hero, who you can only do so much to, you can't spin him around too far, that's always the hardest thing to write. Um, but the aliens, I, I love writing Londo. I mean, I could, you know, <laughs> I, I'm sleeping and Londo's still talking. You know. <laughs> making him talk wasn't hard, making him shut up was the hard part. <laughs> um, so, uh, and same with Jakar, but Londo more than anything else. So it's just a matter of looking to, to treat characters authentically and try and follow some kind of realistic voice in doing so. That's a crappy answer to your question. It was the best I got. <laughs> we'll, we'll take what we get. It's every man for himself. So, so, in many ways, Babylon 5 was absolutely landmark in the history of American television. It's really set the stage for a lot that's happened since. So some of the innovations were structural, so the use of an ensemble cast on science fiction, the sort of dynamic development of characters uh, who change over time, uh, the notion of serial, the sort of story, long season-wide story arcs and a five-season plan are all, the thi all things that sort of are part of the structure of Babylon 5. So could you say a little bit about the thinking that went into pushing science fiction in that direction? I, I again, I grew up a fan. And I come to Babylon 5, or came to it as a fan. And I thought, what did I always want to see? And I love British television. I love The Prisoner and Blake 7, Tripods, you know. And I thought, the, the British will give credit to their audience for having an attention span of more than, you know, half a minute. <laughs> and we'll set up something and pay it off weeks later. What if you took that to its logical extension and set up something in season one and paid off in season five, you know? Will an audience stick around and remember? Uh, let, let's, let's just for a change of pace bank on the intelligence of the American audience. And let's start treating this as a book. So it's, the first move was to structure it along the lines of a, of a novel, with introduction, rising action, complication, climax, and then you walk. And that became each season. And once I had that structure in mind, the rest of it fell to itself. Um, the other parts of it were, again, looking for innovative ways to make the show different. I figured if I'm going to fail uh, in doing this, I want to fail big, number one. And I may as well do all the stuff at once that I wanted to do. I want to shoot it in the widescreen. I want to shoot it you know, with a lot of CGI. I want to shoot you know, with big ensemble characters and try and get away from the funny forehead stuff. You know? um, so it really was rolling up all my opportunities into one basket because I might not have another basket to put it into. Okay. <laughs> so. One of the, the this, this idea of multi-season design that you set out to do was you sort of you still have to deal with the vagaries of network television, including the fact that you got canceled prematurely and then had to come back from the dead. How did that affect the original plans for Babylon Five? Um, well, we had to obviously shove some of the fifth season to the fourth season. We got we were told shut it down. Um, 
But there are always some vagaries. And, and whenever you're working with a network, there's always going to be some give and take to them. The good thing was that in our case, because they trusted me, God knows why, um, they actually began leaving us alone. So after episode two of year two, we almost never got notes. One of the very few times they called in season two was the script came in and they, they said, um, there's a scene where Londo was cheating at cards and he's... <laughs> Do I read this correctly? <laughs> Says the guy from Warner Brothers. That he is using his genitals <laughs> to cheat at cards. Yes. <laughs> and there was this real long pause. And he said, you know, we trust you. I, I, I know, I know. Well, what we're going to do is you pretend you didn't write it, and I'll pretend I didn't read it. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> that, was, that was a huge help to us, the fact that they would trust us in that fashion. Um, but because of the season four glitch, um, there's, a, there's a chunk of season five, the start of it, that is lumpy and irregular. It's, you know, the colonic test kind of a thing. Um, and I, I would, had, I, had they not said shut it down, it would have been a much, I think, cleaner fifth season. But they did, and we had to adjust to it. And we, had, we fought to get our fifth season on, and we, we got it on. Um, so the story was completed, but not without a few bumps on the road. So one of the hallmarks of the series is you wrote 92 of 110 episodes of Babylon 5. So... What's the trade-offs between individual authorship and collaboration working in television? There's, when you have a staff working for you, there's more chance for innovation and people who can say to you up front, this, is, this sucks, you know, and, and keep you back on track. Fortunately, I had the actors for that. They were really good at saying, you really suck. <laughs> um, but for me, Bad One Five was a novel, which had to be written as a novel. And after the first two seasons, it became so interwoven that I had a hard time pulling out different threads to say that writer A, you do this part, and writer B, you do this part. It all became one big tapestry. And so I decided to go ahead and, and write them all, or mostly all. And what I didn't know at the time was that no, this had never been done before for an hour show. Um, and there's a reason why no one had ever done it. Because <laughs> it's impossible and running the show at the same time. So that every day I was also um, editing, prepping shows. When you're making a, a TV series, you are writing one episode, prepping the next, shooting the, next, the third episode, posting the fourth episode, delivering the fifth episode, all at the same time. And so that was my days. And at night I would go home and just write until I passed out. Um, I got about, for five years I got about three hours of sleep a day. I had not a gray hair in my head. When, this was in two years, so that one five <laughs> will happen. Um, but I, I, I would not do it again because it would kill me. <laughs> but I would relive the experience because creatively it was, a, it was a, an amazing opportunity to have one, one singular voice in charge of a show. Not to say it's the best voice, not to say that you know, someone like Ron Moore or Chris Carter or anybody, you, know, you, anybody could have done a better job than I did. But for me to enjoy the process, uh, there, there are no parallels. It was, it, was a, it was one of the best creative experiences of my life. Well, somewhere along the same time you were doing all of that, you managed to go online and interface with your fans, uh, yeah, one the of the bastards. first producers, <laughs> to really use, cyber, you know, use cyberspace to create a different relationship with the audience. So what did you learn from that process, and would you do it again? Hell no. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was... You understand, I, I was on the nets long before I was anybody. I was on the nets as a fan. I was hanging out in, in chat boards and message boards and uh, uh, um, small local 300 baud connections. Remember 300? Yeah. Um, K Pro 2. Yeah. 178K on a disc, that was, was home, you know? 
Um, so I was there long before I began doing the show, and then when I got Babylon 5, I thought, well, now what do I do? Because everyone else I knew who was a producer said, don't go online. It's, it's scary. <laughs> They're mean. <laughs> uh, you know, well, look, as a fan myself, nothing would have been more wonderful for me than to get an email from Rod Serling or Ray Bradbury or Harlan Ellison. Not that I am fit to carry those gentlemen's pencil boxes, but the theory is there. And I, number one, I want to, as a fan, have that discussion. Number two, I want to create a document, which is now being archived in, in book form, of a conversation with fans about the making of a show. Because my sense is that unless you understand why things are done the way that they are done, you will never have the opportunity or the chance to change it and get what you want. So I tried to open up a door, not just to use it for publicity purposes, which a lot of, a lot of folks do now, but to say, here's what we did today, and here's why it happened this way, and here's what went wrong, to try and, again, inform the audience about the making of a show from the inside. Because uh, that, again, I would appreciate it having as a fan. Most of my decisions are driven by, this would be cool. <laughs> That's as deep as I go. Um, <laughs> And that process was, was often hard. There were, there were stalkers that I got. There were email bombs I got. I got a Trojan that wiped up my hard drive one day. Um, it was, oh, yeah, you have no idea. Uh, it was ugly. Um, and the, the Trek fans descended on me en masse, you know. Um, it, there were days I said, why the hell am I doing this? But no, I made a promise. I, I don't break my promises to, to stay with this. So even with the stalkers and the hassles, I thought it's worth doing it to create that conversation. And a lot came out of it. I, I still get emails from, from fans who are discovering the show for the first time on DVD, um, and I respond to them, which scares the hell out of them. <laughs> <laughs> and correct their spelling. Um, <laughs> and I've, I, I've told this story elsewhere, and I, I actually tell it now without dissolving into tears halfway through. But as an example of, of what uh, the, the show did, there was an um, email I got one day from a um, gentleman who said, um, we're fans of Babylon 5, and uh, our daughter uh, was very small, uh, was, very, was born troubled, had problems. And for some reason, whenever Babylon 5 came on, I could hold her in my arms, and she wouldn't be flailing around, and she would actually watch the show. And she was quiet. And those, those, I savored those moments with her when she was here to have that. And she said, you know, she passed away not long ago. And I go down into the, my, my wife's in bed upstairs. I go down into the um, living room and I fire up a Babylon 5 episode. I hold a cushion in my arms. And it's healing for me. And when you realize you know, you've touched someone's life like that, you know, what, what is... There is no measure to that. There, there is no corollary to that. There is no judging or weighing that. That's the impact of television. And that you could tell a story that touches someone and in, in, makes that bond there. Um, another email from a woman who said you know, her, her brother had been dying of AIDS. And he asked her to um, put a tape together of all of Jakar's speeches about not giving up hope. And he would play them by his bedside in the hospital. And she said, I want you to know that he, he passed away last night to the sound of Jakar's voice. You cannot hear those stories and not be moved. And remember, you know what? All the shit, all the spam, all the Trojan viruses, all the hate mail, it was worth it. Those two stories, you know. And that's how you judge yourself. It, it, it's, it's the work and the impact that you have. I mean, the, the poet who sits down one day and writes, Beauty is truth, and truth is beauty. This is uh, all you know and all you need to know. He's done for the day. <laughs> he can knock off. He just bought immortality. You know? So it's, it's the work and the reaction. And the television gives you the widest reaction possible um, to know that there are people around the world who have learned uh, Jakar's um, Declaration of Principles and has been used in wedding ceremonies and church sermons and synagogue sermons used in speeches and pagan prayers. Yeah. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. So speaking of church services, I'm looking back... This better be really good. 
look, looking back over your work, getting ready for this, I was struck by just how often themes of religion cropped up, not just in Babylon 5, but in Jeremiah and Twilight Zone, you know, on a number, number of the shows you've worked on. And, and those, you know, given science fiction's history is a kind of rationalist science genre, it's, religion usually gets short shrift. And I wondered if you could speak some to why, the, why your persistent interest in faith and stories of faith uh, in, in the shows that you run. The first obligation you have as a storyteller is to be honest, is to tell the truth. That's what um, um, James Cagney's mom once told him preparing for work as an actor. She, she said, the job is to plant your feet, face the wind, and tell the truth. And that's the writer's job as well. And much as the, uh, there's a lot about Star Trek that I like, the notion that religion will vanish 200 years hence is foolish. Um, religion has been with us since you know the first stories were told around a, a campfire about the forces moving in the dark, and they were with us a thousand years from now. Um, new ones will come along to replace old ones, but there'll always be something there. And uh, if I'm going to have that assumption, then I have to have characters who believe one thing or the other. And I don't necessarily. I'm not a believer myself. I'm an atheist. Therefore, I'm equal opportunity offender. Um, <laughs> but. If I'm to be honest in the storytelling, then those who I show of faith can be equally good or bad. And we had actually more uh, characters of faith who were decent guys um, than uh, bad guys. Mostly they were good guys. In fact, uh, there was um, some write-ups in, in Catholic papers about Babylon 5. And then you know, we had a, a minister, on, on the, uh, a priest, on the show, a monk on a regular basis. And uh, uh, um, this happens a lot on Babylon 5. But again, that's part of being honest. And it, it puzzles the hell out of people. You know, why is an atheist writing about religious guys in an honest way? But you, you can't do it. The moment you, go, you start putting up straw men, call it a day. You're done. You, know? um, you have to be honest. So another of the ways that Babylon 5 was innovative is you, you expanded the story beyond the core series into standalone movies, into the spinoff series like Crusaders. You know, today we're seeing this more and more with so Battlestar Galactica has been exploring, you know, is about to, you know, launch new series after the end of the original, has done Mobisodes online. So could you say a little bit about how you think about these extensions of the story into other, other series or other media? On one level, it was a fun thing to do. We had the opportunity to do it. And when TNT picked up the fifth season, they said, do you want to do some TV movies? And I said, sure. In retrospect, I should have said no, and I should not have done Crusade. For the following reason. I set out to do a five-year story. And upon telling that story, I said early on, it's five years and out. I should have stuck to that. But there is a lure and an attraction of working with people you like. We had a great crew. We had a good environment. And my own personal fear came out because I thought, Having done this, what next? Um, I had rep developed a reputation for being, shall we say, difficult. <laughs> Pain in the ass is another word. Uh, and what if someone doesn't hire me? And I fell prey to the one thing I've always fought against, which is the fear of failure. Well, if I stay in this universe, I stay in this box, I can go on a little further. And that was a failing on my part. That was, that was one of the very few times I capitulated to failure, the fear of failure and did Crusade. And while there was much to commend that show, and there were some good stories we told, and there were just better stories yet to come, it was still in the very rough nascent stage of, of, of development when uh, TNT pl pulled the plug for reasons that had nothing to do with the show, um, but more to do with the demographics. Um, I should not have done them. And I've learned from that in the aftermath. And, and it, took, it, it took the last DVD to really make me understand that I was still holding on to part of that fear. Because there's a part that says I want to prove that it wasn't a one-off, that I could do this. And there's a part that holds on to what is familiar. And when I finished directing that directed dvd movie, I looked back and I said, now, have I just added to what I have created, or have I subtracted from that which I created? I subtracted from. And I shouldn't be doing that shit. So, I told you know, Warner's, look, I'm not going to do any more of these. 
if at some point in the future they want to do a Babylon 5 massive feature film with a massive budget where they back up the money truck. Um, <laughs> for me and for the show. Um, you know, where we have a chance to give the show its proper due rather than, because the DVD was up for like $3 million, which is, you know, nothing. Um, where I can give the show its proper due and respect, I'll consider it. But if I can't give the show its due for what it was for those five years, I shouldn't be doing it. And I made that very firm commitment to that. So, Jeremiah. <laughs> Your segues are astonishing. <laughs> what? what am I going to do? I am in awe. They are also in awe. Some might call a silent laughter. I've heard they give it as awe. Well, hopefully they're not all full. Uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, Jeremiah. Yes. Jeremiah is set in a post-apocalyptic universe, which means it's a somewhat different genre than the sort of space opera you worked with in Babylon 5. Mm -hmm. So as you thought about that project, what was it you wanted to accomplish uh, in that space? What, what kinds of stories did that allow you to tell you, tell as a genre, that you couldn't tell in Babylon 5? The best part about post-apocalyptic fiction is that it erases the rules, and it reduces humanity down to its most fundamental elements. And we take a lot of that for granted. I mean, we all have you know, the notion of property rights. But there was a time when that which you owned was that which you could hold on to and someone was bigger and stronger than you, they could take it away from you. And so it was only like the last 200 years that you had property rights as a real big important thing for the average person. And so the chance to peel back those rules, to me, is the most exciting part of that genre because you can have fun with it and really sort of re-examine the big questions. And to me, writing is all about the big questions. It's all about you know, why are we here and where are we going and what does it all mean and we're gonna get changed for 20 after 10 o'clock. You know? So it's all about exploring new areas. And for me, that was a new area. Um, that's why after Changeling, uh, the first movie that I took on was to adapt Max Brooks' World War Z. Um, for um, Brad Pitt's company. And we have a director, Mark Forrester, attached to it. And when I met with the guys at Paramount, he said, you know, why, why do you want to? You just did Changeling, this big Oscar were the thing, why would you want to do zombies? <laughs> zombies. <laughs> zombies are cool. Yeah. <laughs> Shoot them in the head. It's great. Because yeah. I, I, I've seen the Night of the Living Dead at least 100 times, without exaggeration. Dawn of the Dead, almost as many. Day of the Dead, Tea Time of the Dead. I've seen, you know. <laughs> All of them, all the way through. And I love zombie movies, you know? And I go where the fun is. I mean, this movie could be fun. I don't care if it's, they said this is a drop down, and your, my agent said don't do it, because you, know, you did mainstream dramas. <laughs> so I think it, you have to go where the fun is. And to me, post-apocalyptic was fun. Zombies was fun. Um, I also did, um, uh, there was a book called They Marched in the Sunlight, based on the um, campus riots at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which was a chance to kind of go back into that period for me and explore the, the 60s. And there were no monsters, no zombies, you know, except for you know, Lyndon Johnson. Um, and I took that one on. And so I, I don't show any noticeable pattern. My agent keeps trying to get me in a straight line to do just, just genre stuff or just mainstream or just historical stuff. I'm all over the map. You know, I'm doing Forbidden Planet right now for Warner Brothers. Um, just finished up in Ninja Assassin. Um, and I, I'm on tap to do a drama right now. Um, there's a project I can't talk about, the Top Secret, but I'm really excited about it. It's also mainstream drama. Uh, doing Lensman for Ron Howard, a big science fiction franchise thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just, I, I, I don't settle. I, I'm like a moving target, you know? And the good thing is if you're in one area, if you just do like superhero movies, Every time you do one of those in a row, your, your salary goes up enormously. If you do a drama over here and then a horror story over here, you, you stay at the same level. You don't jump up. It's, I don't care. It's not about the money. You know? Stephen King once said that if you write for the money, you're a monkey. If you write for the fame, you're a monkey. If you write because you love writing, you're still a monkey. <laughs> you write because to not write is suicide. 
And that's where I come at this. You know, it's, it's fun for me. It's exciting. That's what I live for. I write 10 hours a day every day. And when I, I've taken two vacations in 20 years. I mean, I mean, not even a weekend, two vacations. And the first of those was after um, uh, Captain Power. And my wife at the time, we went to London. And she said, now you're gonna, just going to go, and you're going to have a good time. <laughs> you're not going to write. Leave all your that shit at home. All right, fine. So we went to London, and within two days, I was vibrating so badly from withdrawal that I went to a pharmacist and got a little spiral bound notebook and a pen. <laughs> and I was in the bathroom at night working on my next novel. You know, I'd be hearing, what, are you, what are you doing in there? It's like when you were in high school, but different reasons. Um, <laughs> nothing, nothing. You know. By the time I got back from England, I had outlined my next novel, which I went on to sell to B.P. Dutton. You know, I, I, I can't not write. I go insane. You know. and, but to do that, because it, writing is a, a hard, lonely job, you got to do things that are fun. And writing should not be homework. Writing should be fun. Writing should be effortless. And that's, that's, that's where you, if those nascent writers out there, that's where you want to get to. You want your writing to become effortless after a while. Um, the, the example I tend to use is you got two guys in a dance room, and you got the guy over here who just got out of the, you know, uh, Arthur Murray dance school, and you can see him in his head going, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And over there you got Gene Kelly. <laughs> He's just dancing. You got trying to dance and dancing. You got trying to write and you got writing. That is the goal. That is the aspiration. When I'm in that, well, sometimes I'm over there a lot and it pisses me off. <laughs> but when I'm over there, there's something holy going on. And that's what you live for. And you write 10 hours a day and you get one or two hours in that corner of the room. And the rest is over there. But for those two hours, you know, it's worth any sacrifice. That's, that's the best thing in the world. So clearly at some point superhero <laughs> comics represented one of the places you wanted, you wanted to explore. How, how did you make that transition from doing TV to comics? They asked me. Um, I, I was working on, in some TV show or other, <clears throat> and uh, DC said you want to write a fill-in for us one time. I did a one issue fill-in for, for DC. And I like writing comics. I mean, the time I spend putting in on comics, I could spend writing two or three movies and make you know, a gazillion dollars more. But it ain't about the money. I like comics. I like writing comics. I enjoy reading comics. Um, so again, it's all about following the fun of it. And having grown up on comics and, saw, and seeing what the impact was on me as a young kid to get a sense of morality and, and reading from comics, I thought, there's an obligation to give back. So I try and always tackle issues of morality in my books and issues of, of controversy and issues of... When 9-11 happened, uh, Marvel <coughs> called and said, we need someone in the Marvel Universe to address this. And Spider-Man is, is a logical choice because he's a New York native. Would you write an issue for us that deals with this? And immediately the, the fear of failure thing came in and, and I, I battened it down because the whole world will be watching this one. If I screw this up, I'm going to get hammered. And I said, I, I'm sure the words are in the dictionary somewhere for, for what that story would be, but what order to put them in, I have no idea. And I said, give, give me two days to think about it. And then they were going to move on. So I thought about it for two days, and I decided, I just, I can't. I don't, I don't know what that story is. And I was on the set at Jeremiah, and I just, taking a break from shooting, and I was in the producer's trailer, it was snow, um, and the early snow. They, I thought, I'm going to try one more time. And the words, there are no words, came out. And suddenly this prose poem meditation happened, which in a, in a style I've never written in before or since, by the way. And I wrote the whole thing in 45 minutes and sent it off to Marvel as was. No editing, no nothing. And it got published with a black cover. And that issue has been one of the most importantly received Marvel books they've ever done. Um, I hear it still to this day from firemen, from priests, from uh, people who were there, um, what it meant to them and how honest it was and that it was not jingoistic. 
it was more of a questioning than anything else. Why weren't we here? What weren't we paying attention to? And the chance to do that story alone is worth everything else. Um, and I try and do things in other ways that are not expected. When Marvel said, you want to write Thor? I thought, sure, why not? I love the character. It could be fun. And he said, we want to bring back Asgard. What do you want to do with that? I said, I want to put Asgard in Oklahoma. <laughs> why? Well, you could see it from a long way off, for one thing. <laughs> but what I wanted was that dichotomy. There was a time in, in mythology when you could be walking across a, a field somewhere in Greek mythology and come across Diana or you know, Hercules or any of the number of uh, Greek and Roman uh, gods of the, of the time. And I wanted to have that mix of things so that you could be working at, this, at a gas station in Oklahoma and turn around and there's Heimdall standing behind you asking to borrow a wrench. You know. <clears throat> And the best part of that was having uh, uh, the Asgardians there for town meeting <laughs> when they're discussing plumbing problems <laughs> and indoor plumbing, which is a new concept for the Asgardians. And what do you do? You, you haven't got toilets there? No, we sling it over the walls. <laughs> <laughs> the goats love it. <laughs> the neighbors, not so much. <laughs> so it, it's, again, playing with the contrast and, and, and doing what hasn't been done before. Because um, if you're doing what's been done before, then you're competing with all the guys who came before you. You strike out on your own, and you can't be judged against that. So part of the fascination with Thor is the fact that he's a mythical figure who also now is a superhero. and invites us to think about the relationship of classic mythology to the superhero genre. So I wonder if you could say something about uh, the, what, what do you see as the carryover from ancient stories into modern superhero comics? Outside Thor or only inside Thor? Wherever you want to go with it. <laughs> I shouldn't throw down a challenge to this guy. Compare and contrast. Ancient Aztec civilization with a Studebaker. Um, <laughs> one has wheels, and those were the Aztecs. That's why they died. Um, well, Thor, I have no good answer for this. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, my brain went absolutely totally blank. I haven't got the answer for you at all. I can lie really well if you want me to. But... Well, should we find out how well he lies? <laughs> I don't lie. I don't bullshit. I never bluff. All right. Fair enough. We will, keep, we will keep moving forward. So as I was asking around for questions to ask you, I had a number of readers. Uh, people... I never saw it before in my life. <laughs> People it doesn't resemble me at all. People asking whether Rising Star was an influence on four, the 4400 4, or Heroes, and other people said Supreme Power was clearly derived from DC's Golden Age. So those both sort of invite this question of how much do authors borrow from the genre tradition, where does resemblance go too far, you know, so forth. Um, there was a, as I recall, and those who are comics fans, Correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't there a point when DC did their version of the Marvel characters and Marvel did the version of DC characters? Yes. Yeah. So there was like a swap that they arranged ahead of time to make Supreme Power happen on the other side as well. Heroes was not the same situation. Um, there was Rising Stars and Heroes, which looks a great deal like Rising Stars. Um, there are other terms for that. <laughs> but I will be nice. Um, Babylon 5, the Space 9, just saying. Um, <laughs> so the show that has normally a big old starship is set on a space station with a big old bar and gambling areas and casinos and um, trading that goes on. Really, and ambassadors, son of a bitch. <laughs> the same time my show's going on, I thunderstruck. Um, what the hell was the question? <laughs> oh, yes, theft. <laughs> um, look, to some degree, we, we are all standing on the shoulders of giants. <clears throat> to some degree, we all owe a debt to what preceded us. Some more than others, some owe a check. Um, 
<laughs> um, Michelangelo once said that um, bad artists borrow, good artists steal. And it took me a while to figure out what the hell that meant. A bad artist takes what someone else did and imports it whole cloth, just sort of borrows it without understanding it. And you'd be writing, reading his stuff and come across this lump of, that's borrowed from over here, and they go on to the next part. A good artist steals in the sense that you take what was done over here and you morph it into yourself, you make it part of yourself, a permanent part of yourself, and it comes out in a, in a new morphed kind of way that is, is emblematic of yourself. So there's not been you know, a, a science fiction story ever written about robots that didn't owe something to you know, the three rules of robotics. You know? um, nothing about space that doesn't owe something to Heinlein. But there's whole cloth theft and then there's homage. Uh, and I try as much as possible to avoid theft. Um, I have done the occasional homage. I mean, there were homages to, to Tolkien in, in uh, Babylon 5, to um, uh, Alfred Bester, who ended up, I used the name of the character, um, many others. But I, I try, McLange also said, where I steal, I leave my knife behind. You know, so you, 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 when you, I steal from Alfred Bester, I use his name to say, you know and I know where this came from, you know, to be honest about it. So, Quite apart from stealing, can we talk about uh, working for licensed characters? So you've created a lot of original material. You've also written for characters like Thor and Spider-Man. Uh, what, what are the challenges of working in someone else's sandbox? Well, I think you have an obligation. When someone says to you, here's this character who is a trust of ours and been around for 50 years and don't screw him up, you have an obligation to treat that character fairly. And to, and to hand it back to the company as good a condition as he was when you first got him. With your own characters, it's more of a freedom to experiment, to do different things, to screw them up a little bit more. Uh, fiction done properly is about putting your character up a tree and throwing rocks at them. <laughs> and when it's a franchise character, the rocks are very small. <laughs> and they don't leave lasting marks. When it's your own character, you can cut off an arm. Who gives a shit? You know? <laughs> So that's probably the, the biggest difference is the, the amount of creative freedom. Um, and, no, and to know that you're working in, in, on hollowed ground. Uh, hollowed ground. It could be hollow too, but you know. <laughs> if it's not the mole man, then it's hollow. <laughs> if it isn't the mole man, then it's hallowed. So, and you have to respect where you are. And, and there's a lot of people who come into a book and say, I will put my fingerprints all over this. Screw you. It's not about your fingerprints. It's about respecting the character and trying to find some corner of it that no one has explored before. That's cool. But you don't remake the character just because you can. You have to respect what goes before you. So you faced a fair amount of reader controversy over some of the things that happened with Spy on your run on Spider-Man. No. <laughs> so you, you lie, Jenkins. <laughs> So, uh, what obligation as a writer do you have to the readers of a long-standing series, quite apart to the character? I challenge you not to use the word so for the next half hour. <laughs> <laughs> Every time we do, a buck for charity. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, the stories I've done that were controversial um, were tended to be things where I, I tried, again, to find new areas to go into. For instance, some people didn't like the, the, the totem aspect of Spider-Man, that there was like a spider god kind of thing. But it, it occurred to me, look at his, his bad guys, his enemies, his villains. They all tended to have animalistic or totem powers. You, have, you know, the rhino, the croc, the vulture, you know, the, the sand crab, you know. It, it, the, you know <laughs> it went on, the, the mussel, you know. It went on from <laughs> The dreaded oyster <laughs> with a pearl inside of him. You know. um, it, it, it was, you know, this is, this is a, a higher animal villain percentage than any other character that I'm aware of. There might be something here to explore in terms of why them and why him. And during that story, I made a point, though, never to have Peter buy into it. 
At no point does he say, yes, you're right, it's all about you know, totemistic powers coming from elsewhere. He, being a rational character, would never go there. So he never quite buys into it, which is my license to get out of it. You know? I can posit that all I want. Those around him can posit it all they want. But because he is who he is, he has to go, that's great, that's interesting, I'm glad you feel that way, but I don't agree with you. So, and the one more day thing, um, my, my end run on Spider-Man was not my story. That was Joe's story. And I respect that he wanted to tell that story. Uh, I can't believe that a superhero would sell a soul to the devil. That just doesn't work for me. Um, but it's not my call. You know, when you are working on an established character for a major company, to some degree, you are a hired hand, or a hired gun. And so I did what I was asked to do, and then left the book. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep the rest of it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of being magical, this reminds me. <clears throat> Again, I, I'm, I'm really not, not a magic trick. It's not different. I'm really big on creating moments where you always remember it because, again, we are here to be magical. We're here to do things that bring life into a room, you know, that add to a room rather than sucking life out of it. I was speaking at the Icon Convention in Long Island a number of years ago, <clears throat> and there was going to be a dinner on this one particular day, and we were going to have all the guests there and make presentations and whatever. And it was due to start at 8 o'clock, and said, don't eat, we have a big dinner all set up. So we arrived there at 8 o'clock, just famished, there by the commons, and there's delays, and this person wants to go first, and there's no food, you know, when it hasn't even started yet, 8, 8.15, 8.30, 8.45. And those at my table were starting to pass out. <laughs> and the, the food was in another room. Now, wait a minute. We're sitting in a room next to the commons, which has a cafeteria. <laughs> and there's food there. <laughs> I should go where the food is. <laughs> so I leave the room, and I go out, and I order a big old pizza. And I bring it back into the room. <laughs> and my table has food now. Now, the rest of the tables are all pissed off. Because <laughs> they didn't think of it. <laughs> so I said, did you bring enough for everyone? He says, no, says I, but I can fix that. So I leave the room again. Back to the cafeteria. Kitchen's closed, but they have snacks. So they have baskets about this size, filled like this with snacks. So I want that. <laughs> all of them? Like 200, you know. Yes. So they sell me and the basket to go with it. <laughs> so I get this basket of stuff. And I return back to the room. And I go from table to table like saying a demented Easter bunny. Standing you know. <laughs> <laughs> out, you know. <laughs> and the con organizers are pissed at me at this point, you know, and making light of their situation. But everyone remembered that day. In fact, about two years ago, I was at San Diego Comic Con, and a guy came up to me with a little snacky. And he said, this is a snack from Icon. <laughs> Which I've kept to remember that amazing moment. <laughs> Would you sign it? <laughs> I did. But, and, 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 but people remember that moment. When you make moments like that, when you, when you step out of yourself and make a little tiny piece of magic that big, people remember for the rest of their lives. Isn't that extraordinary? Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> well, looking forward to the next time. <laughs> looking forward to the next con. You're up for an Eisner for the 12. So Three Eisners. Yeah. Three, yes. Uh, could you? Oh, win them. That's okay. Because there are much better writers working out there than me right now. So, could you tell us a little bit about the thinking that led to the twelve? Uh, you're bringing vintage World War II style pro pulp protagonist into 
contemporary culture? What, what, is, what are you wanting to explore as you juxtapose those, those two worlds? All your questions are serious. Um, I like the idea of bringing back and reinventing characters uh, that have been dormant for a long time. And there were a number of characters from the Marvel early years that were just extraordinary, uh, particularly because they looked so boneheaded. Uh, there was the, the Blue Blade, who, whose costume, costume was this big old hat with a feather, pantaloons, no shirt. <laughs> Slippers. <laughs> and when Marvel had me you know, debut the character at Comic-Con, I said, and his, his superpower is, he ha is that the, ability, the ability to hang out in men's rooms and parks after dark. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were not happy. <laughs> um, rock man. Rock man. His power is like a rock. Yeah. But, but, but again, it's a chance to have fun with it. In um, the case of Rockman, which is the most stupidest name for a hero ever created, um, there was the origin given that he came from this land far beneath the earth and was separated from his people and is now up here somewhere and fighting the good fight. I thought, okay, let's, let's keep that origin for a second. And we, I show that origin in the book. And I said to the artist, when you draw the panels, draw them in just this way. You see him you know, fighting the bad guys into the tunnels. You see the ground caving in. You see you know, him coming out above his kingdom, and it's all gone. So I'll wait an issue or two down the road, and then I tell the real story, which that this guy, back in, they, they, they've been asleep in this like, uh, suspended animation for like 60 years. This, they all come, come to us from 1940, approximately, 41. And he was a miner, as, as in the miner who works underground. And he was down there digging, and they were trying to organize a union, and they were opposed to it. There was, you know, they tried to kill him because he was a union organizer. An accident happened, the thing blew up, and the whole mine collapsed, including the, um, uh, uh, the houses above it, killing his family. And the shock of this was so horrific to him that he couldn't face it. And he created this whole fantasy world to surround himself. So he talks about trying to find his people and find the princess which is his daughter. It turns it. It turns the diamond. And shows you the whole different side of it. You, know? you take this, this goofball of a character and, make him, make, and you feel sympathy for him. And that's the fun of it. it takes, that's what draws me to those kind of characters. It's a chance to dig my hands in there and pull out the stone and say, we all look at it this way. How about this way? Look at that. And in just a minute, we're going to open up the mics for questions from the floor. So if people want to line up at these two mics, uh, we'll be happy to. <laughs> All right, so we're getting stampedes, but. Godfrey Daniels. So. Wall tell, of human flesh. What can you tell us about Lensman and about Forbidden Planet? What's motivating a return to these vintage science fiction stories right now? I love it. I love it. Again, um, Forbidden Planet is one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, those who have seen Forbidden Planet know what a great film it is. And I thought of a cool way to approach the story, again, that no one's done before. So I'm playing with that. And Lensman is one of the great classics of science fiction and done on a scale that you really couldn't do 20 years ago. So and as an example, one, OK, don't tell anyone this scene. <laughs> Imagine, if you will. Two ships, big old fleet battle, okay? 100 ships over here, more over here, fighting it out in the depths of space. Two ships locked down with gravity beams, circling like scorpions in a bottle. From one ship, out comes a boarding party. Out from this ship comes a party to fight them back. So you have hand-to-hand -hand combat between two ships fighting it out in the middle of a big fleet. Fuck me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, to see that on the screen is going to be pretty cool. Right. <laughs> All right, we'll start over here. Coming up on a tendential uh, issue there, 
You said in Babylon 5 you got to work a lot with computer graphics and you know, wanted the whole big show. One big part of the show was the music by Chris Franke, I thought. It really gave the show depth that Crusader didn't match later on. How much do you like to get involved in that? How much do you think it's important to your work to select the backdrop and say, no, really, you know, do all these graphics <coughs> different, get a different music artist? How much does that aspect matter in your work? Huge. I, I love music, and I love cinema music. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> whenever I, a script, the process is first a script comes along, I sit down with Chris and say, this is kind of what I'm thinking about, this is the tone of it. My line was always, this is opera. Think of this as being one big opera. And <clears throat> he would go away and then send me tracks, which I would then play against the, the scene to make sure it was right. And there are moments when, in the final mix, I'm in there, again, hands, hands and, 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 and tongs, adjusting the music. Cause I, I said, give me separate tracks, percussion here, you know, wind instruments here, so I can ride them up and down. So we've got a big battle scene going on. You may have percussion going on through part of it. Pull the percussion out, then you have this in sound effects of the ships fighting, replacing percussion or serving the purpose of percussion, but keep the rest of the music going throughout it. Or you take all the percussion out, uh, all, all the, the, the warfare fighting out, and just play the music. So I'm, I'm always playing all the different stems of the music as we go along. So I'm, I'm very much involved with the part of the process. I love that part. And Chris, it, there, if, there's a series I might be doing down the road as well. If I do that series, Chris will definitely be a part of it. Excellent. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Yes, go ahead. Uh, why don't I give you a choice between three questions? Okay. Um, well, you we were talking about uh, those uh, interesting similarities. This for you. Interesting and those interesting similarities yes. in writing. I can't help but notice one between. <laughs> no. Between uh, well, you know. Babylon 5 and remember Journey to he Babylon? He never stops. The amazing thing about it. <laughs> Kept right on going. Yes. And the other thing I might want to ask you about is, I could swear that Delenn originally was a man. Yes. And lastly, or if you prefer, just tell us about Manny Faces. <laughs> Manny Faces as in he -Man. Manny Faces is my favorite character on He-Man. He-Man, yes. <laughs> Just, just for my own knowledge and identification, what's the penalty for murder in this state? <laughs> um, well, you said I could answer any, any of those three I chose. You can choose, up to you. Thank you. All or any. <laughs> yes, the, the, the Len had been a man at one time. As had Jenkins. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, it, that was always the intent to start off with her as a him. And into the first season, go and make her into a him, him into okay, him into a her. I suspected that was the whole point of the whole transformation, but yes. they, they already turned her into a woman before then, though. Yeah, because it wasn't working out too well. Um, <laughs> she, she, to, to, the, the amount of makeup to put on her to suggest male was killing her performance, and she was kind of flipping out about it because um, she puts a lot of stock in her female persona, as most actresses do for good reason, right. and um, so I can't handle it. And I agree with her, and we changed the dialogue to make her, uh, um, him into her. And uh, feminized her ahead of schedule. Yes, yeah. precisely. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Over here. Uh, a thank you and a question. Uh, first, just. What do you mean GMs don't kill characters? Yeah, we 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 do. <laughs> kind of kind of like sci-fi writers. You lie. I like sci-fi writers. I've been killed more times. <laughs> Play, playing Call of Cthulhu. It's the D4s. It's, D4s are always. So, uh, aside from the fact that your shirt lies, go ahead. It's, it's off on a good note. Um, I just wanted to thank you. Um, I grew up on those shows, uh, He Man fuck you. and Real Warriors. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that old, man. <laughs> I, 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 at a younger age, I I grew up. Five years old? Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm skipping a hard and, time. And, and, and now I'm a professional writer, so I don't know if that makes you feel older. Excellent. But, uh, uh, so, yeah, I want to I thank you for that, because that did uh, shape a lot of the way uh, that I think and I write. I'm and so sorry. 
I know, but with therapy, I'm slowly recovering. So what, is it what, what do you write? What's up? What do you write? Um, I'm currently a freelance writer for White Wolf. I do some stuff for yeah. the role-playing line. Excellent. Thank Good you. Good work. Um, and I also teach. Uh, so I guess uh, my question involves that. I really love uh, what I'm doing right now. I'd love to continue it, but I also want to someday make the leap uh, into my own stuff. And uh, I would just love any advice on that. Um, go for it. Uh, the, the moment, well, it, it sounds, there, look, there are guys I know who live on the East Coast who say, I hate the weather, I hate the climate, my neighborhood sucks, my job sucks. Move. Go somewhere else. How? You know? <laughs> do it. Just do it. You know, if you're at a point where you think you can do it, do it. And, and, and you will never think you're at that point unless you decide to do it now. Um, stepping away from your job and following your heart is like the hardest thing in the world to do. But if you really believe it hard enough and you have the skill to back it up, you can do it tomorrow. It's, it's, it's not my call. It's when you look into your heart and say, I'm willing to take that chance of failing. Well, thank you. I promise I won't kill your character if you ever game with me. Thank you. Okay, over here. Hey. Interesting. This, this, this row was very small, and that row was huge. I was looking more this way, I guess. So um, you say you prepare yourself for failure. Do you prepare yourself for controversy? I mean, you handle <clears throat> controversy really well. During the discussion of uh, Susan and Talia's relationship in Babylon 5, you had some really elegant, uh, eloquent statements, rather, about the nature of storytelling and telling your characters stories. But are there any controversies that arise out of your work that surprise you or are hard to address? There's always something you didn't see coming. Um, I try, if I find, do something that I know will be controversial, I prepare myself for it. Um, and again, you have to be fearless. You have to not be afraid of these things. You have to stir things up once in a while. Otherwise, there's no point to writing. Um, so all you can do to prepare yourself is just steal yourself to be attacked and to have bad things say about you. Uh, the hardest part was uh, the surprise to me, really, <clears throat> when Claudia left, chose to leave the show and then said afterwards she'd been fired. Um, I've been having a dialogue for fans for five years and been absolutely 100% honest with them all that way. And suddenly everyone said, well, she said she was fired, therefore she was fired. No, she quit. And I got death threats, I got stalkers, I got hate mail, I got physical threats for two years. Though she said in the interview, oh, and by the way, I quit. Where were you two years ago? So that kind of thing I wasn't prepared for. But uh, other than that, usually if I, there's something, a train, train coming my way, I know it's, I know because I set it up in motion. So I'm okay with it. Thank you. There's a saying in the NBA that a lot of the hot, flashy young players don't know the basics. What is a basic that you <clears throat> don't see in a lot of common, <clears throat> or in, in published writers? A basic I don't see. Yeah. <clears throat> Spelling. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I, I, I guess a real love of storytelling. I know a lot of writers who give into it because they think it's a, a way to succeed, a way to get chicks, um, a way to you know, make it, prove something to somebody else. They're not there because they want to be writers. They're not there because they want to spend every day of their life writing. They want the pointy hat that says, I sold something. You know? um, and there's a real lack of appreciation for the basics, for, for just simple structure. Um, I, I think you have to know the structure of a story well enough to then break the rules. You can't break the rules and then learn the structure. Um, and there's a lack of patience. And lack of understanding, there's a difference between the bon mot and the mot juste, between the, the funny word and the appropriate word. You know? And you see a lot more people going for you know, the, the bon mot, the, the funny word, or the, you know, rather than picking the exact word. And the exact word makes all the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. You know, it's, it's huge, that, that, that distinction. So it's taking the time to find exactly the right word. Um, and because I get a lot of sh you know, slipshod, fast writing. I think that's, that's the answer to your question. Thank you. Okay, over here. <laughs> Why, yes it is, thank you. <laughs> Um, do you have a note also? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> um, Too bad. I do have a hotel room key, though. All right. Um, <laughs> I, uh, one, 
I, I watched Babylon 5 when I was like uh, fairly young, but the one scene, well, I actually have two questions. The one scene, <laughs> the one scene I remember is when Garibaldi orders the coffee and the waiter won't give him the coffee with his meal. <clears throat> and my dad does the same thing. And I always, I always think of that scene. And I was wondering, has that ever happened to you? Yes. And then, really? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but when I was working for um, uh, TV Cable Week, which is a publication of Time Incorporated, the editor took us out to Michael's, which is a really fancy restaurant in Beverly Hills, where the Reagans would dine, a lot of blue-haired ladies, you know. And I was I've been writing all night, my eyes were like this, you know. And I sat down, and the waiter in a tux comes over and says, what would Sir like to drink? <laughs> I'll have a coffee. No, no, no. What would Sir like to drink? <laughs> coffee. <laughs> and like I'm the idiot, says, Sir, there are drinks, and then there are aperitifs, and there are after dinner beverages. This is a drink. What would Sir like to drink? <laughs> sir wants a coffee. <laughs> get me a fucking coffee. <laughs> if Reagan were here, he'd get a coffee. <laughs> And you, you make a note of these things. So later on, when Peter Parker was, you know, wanted a coffee, I said, I'm going to get this, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> and then my other question is, um, I, it seemed from your, what you were saying that a, sort of a fear of failure was a big force in your life. And how, I mean, how do you try to bring that out in your stories? Or do you, or do you think it's just, it's unconscious? Or is it sort of just a normal thing? I think it, it, I constantly do try and bring it out once in a while where I have the characters face something that they, they think they can't handle. Um, and surrender to that sometimes. And, and <clears throat> Peter often would find himself in positions where he doesn't know what to do. When, in, in Babylon 5, when Sheridan has to make the decision to rise up against his own government, we do that pushing and dolly back on him, which reinforces him being alone in that moment. And, for, and that's the one time you see real fear in his eyes. I, I know I have to rise up against my own government. Can I do this? Can I really pay this off? Is it the right thing to do? Um, so I think that if you don't have your characters doubt themselves and confront that fear, then viewers looking at them will think to do the same thing themselves. So it's sort of like you try to make it an organic part of how you develop yes. the character. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Over here. Hi. Um, I was wondering if there's any concept that you've seen, for example, 24, that you wish that you had thought of. Oh, constantly. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 am, I am not envy free. Uh, so. Very often there, there are shows I look at that, God, I wish it X Files. You know. <clears throat> I developed a show with Chris Carter for a while. And fascinating, very talented guy. He would always meet in this very dark, shadowed room. <laughs> and he'd sort of be off in the corner, and you hear this voice coming from the shadows, giving you suggestions. Very peculiar. But um, uh, brilliant guy. And I, I watched a show just in absolute awe of, of how smart it was. Tudors. Tudors, Dexter. Um, you just want to, I watch them open my wrists afterward because they're just so good. Yeah. And um, how much marketing and networking do you do um, to promote yourself and what you're writing? Sadly, almost none. <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not a networking kind of guy. Um, I don't like people. <laughs> um, there's fictional characters and real people. Why is it little protect the best? You know? So. Um, I'll back it up and give a more serious answer. <clears throat> I lack people skills. Growing up and moving 17 times, 20 times in 17 years, you don't learn how to talk to people. So I went through high school, from grade one to high school, never talking to much of anybody. Um, you know when you go to the beach with friends and you set up a campfire and you hang out and burn weenies? The first time I did that, I was 18 years old. The second time was never. <laughs> And so I lack networking skills. If I had great skills, I could probably be a much more professional and successful person than I am, but I don't. So I stay home and I write. I write 10 hours a day and I talk to my cat. And he likes me. I bring him food. It's all about the food. Evidently, you mentioned the pizza and the snacks. So it's yeah, good. I'm good with snacks. Yeah. You know? So um, no, I've just, I've never been a network. There are lots of guys who are really good at networking and shitty writers. You know? I will not name them. Um, <laughs> but, they, but the cool thing is the studios are now saying, you know, we're tired of working with children. We want to work with adults. So that you're looking now to you know, writers who are over the age of 40 
to do stuff for them who aren't necessarily the good networking guys, the well-spoken guys. And look, I, and I was the geek in school. I went to my high school reunion, not one person remembered me. Not one. <laughs> yeah. But that, you know, but then that, that's because I was busy watching them, you know, and writing, making notes about them. You know, <laughs> for, and, and burying grudges. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I've always been a geek, I always will be a geek. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> Come join the microphone. <laughs> Be one with the microphone. Okay. Hi. Um, I noticed the last character that you talked about, him being a minor with an unusual history. And when you described it, I just was wondering if you were a huge like Cervantes Don Quixote fan, because it seemed very similar. Um, Cervantes, <clears throat> I love Divine Mad Men. Mm -hmm. I love Don Quixote. I, I love you know, any, any character that, who was demented. Uh, that's a, you write what you know. <laughs> so yeah, I, 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 the, the musical version of Don Quixote, um, Mad La Mancha, I can do every lyric, every line of that musical. I'm not going to. <laughs> don't 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 start. Don't, don't start with me. Uh, so yeah, I do. Yes, those are great characters. You broke it, didn't you? Oh, and while she. Um, and in continuation of what she said, um, how did you get people if, with bad social skills and good work, how do you get lots of people to see your work? Put it on television. <laughs> <laughs> they turn it on and it's there. We, we deliver. Okay, over here. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you have plans for any new uh, creator-owned uh, creator comic book work, whether new series or returning to some of your old stuff, like the uh, Marvel Icon series you did, The Book of Lost Souls, which I like. Yeah, I, I have a contract with Image to do two creator-owned titles. It's just a question of finding the time to do them. Okay. But yeah, I do want to get back to doing some more of those. Any, more, any chance for any more Book of Lost Souls? I enjoyed that. Um, not this juncture, no. Okay. Those, those, that, that book was kind of a, tra a, a, a reward for being exclusive to Marvel, and I ain't no more. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, over here. <clears throat> Just to speak fun about on the geek thing, by the way. <laughs> I, I'm still a geek to this day. <clears throat> While I was working on Jeremiah, and, do we have time for this, by the way? Yeah, sure. We, all time, we open to, for a while? I, we'll stay here as long as you're willing, so. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> While I was working on Jeremiah up in Vancouver, uh, I used to like to go on walks around downtown because you can actually walk in Vancouver at night and it's totally cool and it's safe. And Make the story work, you have to understand something about there's Even though I love writing, I love words, there are some words I just won't use. I just don't. I mean, in my, my personal life. I'll write it, but I won't use it myself. And one of them is a term for female genitalia. It begins with the letter P. Let's say pretzel for the time being. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm, I'm walking. That does connect, trust me. I'm, I'm walking at night at downtown Vancouver, and Vancouver, their, their, uh, their ideas on prostitution are very liberal, and they don't get involved much. And I was walking through uh, after a long day at the set, and there were three young ladies of the evening standing on the corner doing what ladies of the evening do. And one of them, as I walked by, says, would you like some pretzel? <laughs> and and I, I turtled, you know. And she said, what? I said, nothing. And she, I said, would you like some? And she said it again. And I turtled again. And she said, what? And I said, well, there's, there's some terms that I don't use. And she said, you mean like? And she said it again. I said, yes. And she said, bullshit. You know, I said, say it. No. I'll give you a free one. No. So now all three have gathered around me. <laughs> and they say, well, why won't you say it? And I realize I'm about to have a discussion about linguistics. <laughs> with three hookers <laughs> on a street corner. <laughs> Who in my crew driving by right now would believe that?
I said, what, what, what do you ladies call yourselves when you work? It's Wilbur Hookers. All right. Are there other less pleasant words for what you do? And they all darkened. <laughs> but they're going to kick my ass all the way downtown. I said, well, well, why don't you use those terms? And they said, well, it's icky. Icky? Good. That's a good start. What else? He says, well, it's disrespectful. Said, and that's why I don't use that word. And they kind of blinked for a second. And I went, aww. <laughs> Want a free one? No! <laughs> Not a your question. <laughs> well, I do have a question, but first I have a thank you, but I can talk really fast, so it shouldn't be too bad. Me too. <laughs> All right. Um, you and your show, Battle on Five, literally saved my life. My mother is a true psychotic, childhood sexual abuse, childhood torture. My father's side of the family, alcoholic and oblivious. When season three came out, they were getting a divorce, and it was the worst and most violent time of my life. But having something to think about and dream about and look forward to each week, it kept me going. And uh, it kept me dreaming, and it made me start thinking about writing for myself. So um, I did. This is my first novel. I have a signed right. copy. I'd like to give you a gift. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I guess my question for you is. When you get the germ of an idea for a, a, you know, a new TV show or a new movie or whatever, how long does it usually take to grow inside your head? Depends on how big a germ it is. <laughs> um, sometimes it, it, like Babylon Pie, leap whole cloth into my head. Jeremiah took a long time. Uh, it took a couple of months to think it through. Um, there's a little still voice in the back of your head that you have to listen to uh, that it takes time to be quiet, to be still. And, and if, you, if you are quiet and still long enough, the story will come whispering in your ear. And how fast it walks is never under your control. But um, that's the hardest thing to, to do, to learn, is to be patient and wait. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Good luck to you. I gotta follow the life saved and first novel. This is no good. No pressure. So, so there's this quote from you about when you were when you were writing B5. It's like you're writing a novel, and every day you're slapping a page on the wall, and you can never go back and rewrite any of those. And um, I'm a continuity guy. I like really long running stories. I like stuff that goes for years. I like Wheel of Time. I'm one of the three people that likes Wheel of Time, <laughs> right? And, and one of the things that I always remember is I'll be sitting there reading book eight, and they'll be like, oh, yes, and we've been friends for 12 years. And I'll go, I'll be like, what? They, in book one, they'd never met. And I'm, I'm the guy that remembers that crap, right? And every now and again, Decaffeinated I'll, coffee. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Sadly for me, I'm like this without coffee. Anyway, um, so I'm showing B5 to, to some of my friends, right? And so I'll, I'll go through and I'll watch the You have friends. <laughs> I do. I know. <laughs> no one is more surprised oh, than me. Stop. stop. <laughs> no one is more surprised than me. It's okay. How I'm many having times, fun. Wait, wait fun. Joe. How many times have you seen Night of the Living Dead? What? <laughs> Did you catch that? Anyway. Um, so I'm the guy that sees all the continuity errors, and in, in B5, you got 110 episodes, you got like three continuity errors. And then, and then you got in the beginning, and there's like 12, but we'll ignore that. How do you do that? How do you write that and know that four years from now, I'm going to want to write a scene where I'm going to refer back to this? How do you see that that far out? Because you didn't write every script, right? You just had an outline? Um, I wrote 91 out of 110. Right, <clears throat> but, but you knew when you were writing oh, season yes. one yes. that you were going to want to foreshadow this like a piece of dialogue in season four or whatever. Right. How do you see that far and that detailed? You gotta have a mind like a, like a bucket of snakes. <laughs> Which I do. Okay. Um, it's, it's just a glitch. You know, um, I, 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 I'm very detail oriented. Back, I used to belong to a commune back when I was like 18 years old. And a uh, religious commune. We were charged with the task of, of ref this, this does relate, trust me. <clears throat> Uh, putting a new carpet into the um, youth ministry's floor in, in, the, in the building. 
And we went dumpster diving, <clears throat> from dumpster diving to this. And all these big carpet pieces back to glue them down. And everyone's got these big old swaths they're working, putting things down. I'm working with little tiny pieces I'm in the corner, all by myself, very, very psychotic. And tiny pieces. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> right, we finish it up, and the youth minister comes in, looks at this whole thing. Well, I can see what part Joe worked on. <laughs> it's just that's just where my brain goes, you know. And, and, and the cool thing was that two guys, two different guys, one British, one American, created a B5 chronology where they went through the entire series looking for cr uh, continuity things, and they put together a timeline from the birth of the universe. <laughs> I'm not even lying about that. The birth of the universe to Crusade, all right? And during B5 got day by day, month by month, hour by hour in some cases. And they couldn't find any real you know, glitches in the thing. And I just kept it in my head. I didn't like write it down anywhere. It was just in my head. It just, I'm just hardwired that way. Over here. You said as a fanish creator, you've made choices based on that would be cool. And um, it sounds like some, that, that kind of process could lead to a sort of vacuous action, sci-fi explosions in space kind of thing. But you got something better. And so wh why is your that would be cool better than, say, J.J. Abrams' that would be cool? Uh, uh, it's not. It's not. J.J. is really pre pretty good. Um, and uh, I'm guessing that there is one moment of, at least one moment of you in, in Sheridan, and it's the moment where Delenn says, I imagine you on the beach with nothing to do and your head exploding. <laughs> my, my wife said that to me. <clears throat> um, there's two parts to that. The cool part comes in as, as a person. You think, this would be really great to do. And then you take, take that, that mass, that, that gelatinous thing, and then the writer part comes along and says, well, yes, this could be good, but you must move it over here and slice that part off and do this over here. And structure begins to apply itself. And as long as you are honest with your structure and honest with your characters, then the, the result is honorable. If you just stay with the cool stuff and then disregard logic or characterization or that stuff and you just only focus on the cool, then you go astray. But guys like, like JJ and Ron Moore and others don't do that. They stay you know, with what makes sense for the story, although the ending of Galactic I wasn't entirely sure about. Um, but that, is, that aside, the professional part of you comes out to, to rein in the, the, the cool impulse to, and makes it work better. And actually, that adds to it. Knowing the rules, I mean, if you had basketball and you didn't have rules, it's a less interesting game. You know? The rules give it structure and make it more competitive, more interesting. So that, that's what the, but the question about what awful writers don't know, it's to respect those rules that they're there for a reason. Thank you. First off, I, I know what you mean. I, I'm from Mississippi, and for years after I got here, I would walk down the street and go, wait a minute, I'm in MIT. How the hell did that happen? Two questions. You turn left in Mississippi. <laughs> I knew I should have turned right at Albuquerque. Two questions. One, um, I'm going to try and stand on the shoulders of giants without wearing cleats here. Um, Asimov and Clark both said something to the effect of find the smart person or the experienced person, ask them what should be done or what's impossible, and go do it. Mm -hmm. Two things that you did at B5 uh, really took off. One was um, pl pre-planning your storylines and having developing storylines, which people didn't want to do, and now they do. Um, and the other is interacting with fans online, um, where we now have uh, Ron Moore you know, recording the weekly podcast. So you already have your DVD commentary almost the day after the show airs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, you know, part of, part of your legacy to, to television. So what aren't we doing in pre-planning and fan interaction? What should we be doing? What, uh, how are we boneheads? <clears throat> the technology wizards out there, let me give you a preview of things to come. This, this is where I think we're going to see happening in about five years. We're going to see a complete merging of the internet and television, even more so than it is now. So for instance, <clears throat> a game and series will be launched at the same time. You'll have the internet component of that, of fans 
say, let's say Babylon 5 for just a moment, as, as an example, just to use as a structural point. <clears throat> Babylon 5 game, you live on the station, fans hang out, chat boards, you know, uh, avatars, the whole bit. Then an episode airs. At the same time the episode airs, they download a new component into the game. So you can now live in that, that environment, that story, six days before the episode airs. And all the material in that episode, the tactical maps, information, characters, the new worlds they visit, all that stuff is downloaded to your system. And then a, a week later you watch the actual episode and you can choose to stay in that world when the new episode comes along and live here or live in the next episode. And a complete synthesis of the online community with television, where you take every, you stop treating televisions as linear and treat it as a data pool, which elements can be extracted and used in different ways online and in gamings and environments and, and communities and avatars and all that, and second, uh, second life, that kind of stuff, all at the same time, and as one consistent unit. That's what you're going to be seeing, I think, five years from now. Does that include uh, behind the scenes components? All of it. You get to look backstage? All of it. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> second question. There's a, there's a phenomenon that happens, it can happen to any writer, but it, it particularly happens to some successful writers. And I, uh, Stephen King is one that comes to mind, Robert Jordan, George Lucas, where the, the writer has had a success or is perceived as successful or, you know, or they just, you know, freeze up or something. And... Not, not only do they stop editing themselves, but people around them stop editing themselves. You know, stop editing because mm -hmm. they don't want to touch it. It's so good. Yeah, or, or you. you know, if I touch it, the magic smoke will come out. Yeah. And then the magic smoke does come out precisely because no one edited it. And they didn't take out every third adjective and things like that. So how do you avoid that trap? Do you avoid that trap? And how does someone else avoid that trap? You are right in that it is much to be avoided. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of writers, not writers, there are some writers who it becomes being about themselves, not about the story. And they start writing the same sort of thing over and over because that's what worked. And it's the difference between having 10 years of experience versus one year of experience 10 times. And you need to have people around you who are sarcastic and, <laughs> and know you for a long time and we'll call you on, on it when you start falling prey to that stuff. <clears throat> I used to casually know the actor Victor Buono back when I was a reporter. Um, you may or may not know Victor Buono. He was a big, huge, massive actor, physically, just like massive. And he loved going to the Old Globe Theater, even though he's a television actor, and playing there because, as he said to me at the time, they know all my tricks. And at the time, I didn't quite know what that meant, but over time, I figured it out, you know, that, that they didn't let him fall into the easy way of doing certain things. They would always challenge him. And anyone, whether it's a writer, an artist, a producer, a politician, anyone needs someone around them who will be honest with them. And when you stop having that person, you're screwed. And fortunately, all my friends are high verbals and smart asses. So I, I have no lack of modesty imposed on me by others. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the most modest person that I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Died last year. I heard. <laughs> right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for, for the lecture. And just as a comment, I'm sure every geek in, in the city and in this country is deeply proud to count you among, among them. Thank you. Uh, my question uh, goes back to your uh, being detail oriented. In, uh, in much of your writing, uh, in uh, difference to some other science fiction writing, uh, you very elegantly avoid getting into details of how energy sources work, how human alien, <laughs> how human alien biologies might uh, interbreed or not. Um, when you do have to get into uh, yellow cells versus green cells and the telepath virus, which was genetically unsound, I'm sorry. But um, uh, do, you, do you consult? Uh, do, do you consult with uh, textbooks or uh, professors or I realized there wasn't Google or Wikipedia at, at the time you wrote. <laughs> Astrology. How, 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 do you, how, how do you approach this? 
areas you might not not have expertise in, but have slightly less expertise in. <laughs> You're a man, I'd strike you. <laughs> um, no, it's an absolutely valid question. And um, <clears throat> what, the, what you referred to in the first part of your question about not quite getting to the details of how things work, I, I tend to refer to that as, as um, water skiing, where you have to keep moving as fast as you can, because if you slow down, what you're on won't support you. <laughs> and there was a fair amount of water skiing in Babylon 5 that went on, um, and I will be the first to confess that. Uh, in, any, in any science fiction show, there's a certain amount of rubber science that's involved. And I found that you, you, you can go out of your way to explain it if you really choose to do so, but you're dealing with fictional constructs. And after a while, you fall into the peril of technobabble, where you have a five paragraph long description of inverting the, the rays of the system, therefore, the system will now work in different ways. I, I can either do that or I can have a really funny joke. <laughs> and I tend to go for the latter. Um, now, which is not to say we, I, I don't use consultants. Um, during the crusade, as a matter of fact, uh, we had to deal with JPL to supply us with uh, astronomers and engineers and so on who would come and work with us, and planetary geologists uh, <clears throat> who would sit down with us and walk through what the lighting would be like on a set if you had you know, a binary system, what the biology would be like. Uh, we, we built one uh, set, which is set in, in a cavern, and we asked them what kind of strata a, this kind of a planet would have. And he, he actually showed up in the day and said, that, that's mine. That, that's, <laughs> I did that. You know. um, and when I did, recently set out to do Forbidden Planet, I sat down with a bunch of guys from the Mars Society to say, what would a civilization be like a million years hence? What would it look like? Uh, so I, I do try and, and, where possible, do the research on it. But there are times you've got to fudge it. And, and uh, uh, those times, I, I, I rarely get nailed on them, but every so often I do. And, it's, it's, a, it's a right and proper thing to do. Thank you very much. Throw her out. <laughs> Over here. Uh, Thank you. Now that Galactica has finished its run, could you talk about the differing strengths and weaknesses of a sort of free-form, seat-of-your-pants creative approach with the more structured approach used on B5? Um, I didn't see enough of Galactica to make a formal analysis of it. Mm -hmm. And Ron is a friend. And I, said um, I don't believe in, in, in selecting someone else's show. I don't mean um, So uh, can I pass on that part of it and give you a freebie for the question? <laughs> Want a free one? <laughs> well. <laughs> I didn't mean it as a knock to either show, just no. different approaches and different styles. That's all I meant. Yeah, I, no, I understand. And, and things, I don't know that style well enough to do a comp compare and contrast. Okay. Is the cat you were talking about before the one you pulled out of the storm drain? Yes. Okay. My, my pal buddy. Thank you. Yeah. More famous than I am. <laughs> yes, Miss Jam. You've obviously touched a lot of people's lives, but you couldn't have known that that was going to happen back when you were that high. Why did you decide it was important to tell stories? I don't know how to not tell stories. Um, ever since I was a kid, you know, I would just start making up stories and shit. <clears throat> um, it's just what I started doing early on. And again, it, that's how you live forever because the books in the library are there forever. Um, and libraries, I, I, that, that's how I fell in love with writing also. Because <clears throat> he moved 21 times in 17 years, it was always a different school, different neighborhood, different teachers, different everything. But the books in the library were always the same. So I'd be on page 17 of a Ray Bradbury novel in, in Matawan, New Jersey, move to Texas, go to the library, same book, same cover. <laughs> pick up page 18 and keep writing and reading. And it gave me continuity. Words became continuity. Words and stories became the most important things in my life. And I became hardwired for stories. So I think that the question is, I, I don't know how to do anything else. If, if, if we're living in a different society that didn't value stories, I'd be out in the street. You know, that I, have, I have no other skills at all. <laughs> there, there's a reason that I have an ex-wife. I have no skills at all. Um, 
it, it, it's, it's, seriously, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not mechanically inclined. I'm not personable. I'm not a very good speaker. I, I can be okay, but not great. Um, there, is, there is nothing else that I can do but write, which is why I do a lot of it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we've been at this for about two and a half hours, Joe. How do you want to well, we'll, we'll finish up those who were here, and I'll be the, okay. the end of it. That's great. I just wanted to give you your opportunity. If they can handle it, I can handle it. All right. Over here. Hi. He said so. <laughs> What, 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 what do seamstresses do? <laughs> okay. Okay, over okay. Here. okay. Hi, I'm a uh, artist who's currently going to an art school, and um, good place for it. Okay, and I'm interested in becoming a, a comic book artist someday. Okay. Oh, and um, I'm wondering about um, sto what it would take to become a good storyteller in the comic book business. You are so asking the wrong guy. Um, <clears throat> I wish I had an answer for that. Um, the, the art world is outside my, my comprehension. Where, where art comes from is, is, is baffling and, and mysterious and magical to me. Um, it, it, God, I wish I had a good answer. It, it will take as long as it takes for you to understand how to tell a story in graphic form, um, to get the flow of it. There's, the hardest thing in, in, in for our comic artists to do is the, the actual storytelling part of it. It's not just drawing the person being there, it's how that panel relates to the next panel next to it. Um, so that the eye follows the story across. Um, you, when you start selling, I guess is the obvious answer. When you start selling in the comic area, then that's when you've, you've acquired it or you're working for Image. Okay. Stop. What about... What about working with the artist one on one? Do you, how often did you do that? It, it, it's I, I'm, I'm weird because I, I write full scripts, <clears throat> meaning um, page one, panel one, interior, Peter's room. He goes to the door, and reaches for the knob. Panel two, he turns the knob. Panel three, there's a monster outside. You know. so, <laughs> so, and the artist draws exactly what I what I write out because I'm very detail oriented on this stuff. Um, so. There isn't really a collaboration there. Not, in this, not to undermine what the artist brings. There's nothing in the book without the art. And people like Gary Frank and others that I work with have been terrific. But in terms of the storytelling part of it, my, my corner of it, I write specific detailed scripts. And other writers um, work one-on-one? -on -one? Some work in collaboration. Some just work off of plots. And then the artist draws it. And they write the dialogue afterward. There's a whole range of ways of doing it. I wish I had a better answer for you. That's okay. Thank you, though. Thank you. <laughs> I failed. Over here. So. <laughs> Something that fascinates me about these sci-fi shows that are ostensibly set in the future is that in the same way that old Trek is really set in the 60s, Babylon 5 is set in the 90s. Just to give one example, there's this you know, big influential news network that everybody watches passively. And in the real world, that sort of thing's been on the way out since the 90s and may never come back. So my question is, how aware are you when you're, how aware are you when you're writing something set in the future of the ways that it's tied to the present? And do you gleefully embrace it or do you try to get away from it? What do you feel about that? I know that I'm writing for a present tense audience, and I know that I'm, I'm blinkered to some degree by my current cultural situation. We all live in the fishbowl, and trying to imagine what the reality is outside the fishbowl is tough. And, and, you, and if you try and go too far, you'll often be wrong. So I try and write for the relevant audience. Now, the best example I can give to that, <clears throat> there's a great scene in one of the, I think it's the Buck Rogers serials that they had way back in the, in the 30s, um, or 20s, actually. <clears throat> They're, they're in, visualize, they're in their ship, flying over the, way up in the sky, and they're hit, and they're starting to go down. And they say, okay, we have to evacuate the ship, grab your anti-gravity belts, so they get these three slim, slender silver belts, and they put them on, they could be anti-gravity belts, seems reasonable. <laughs> get, get your ray guns, and they get, could be proper ray guns. Get the portable radio, and they bring out this box. <laughs>
because they knew what a radio was. They, a, a, a anti grab belt could be anything, but they knew what a radio was and they were limited by that. They couldn't imagine a radio this size. It was beyond their comprehension. So whenever you're dealing with future fiction, there's a point at which you cannot go. Laptops were in almost no you know, science fiction up until a certain period of years ago. They, they missed the personal computer completely. You know? So we, we miss the obvious stuff. So I, I try and figure, okay, if I'm going to be wrong over there, I may as well stay over here and be more right and write for the contemporary audience and hope that those parts of it that are relevant will last. Okay. I scared yeah. them off. <laughs> yes. I was going to ask a touching uh, question about my favorite episode of Babylon 5, Passing Through Gethsemane. But instead, now that you've brought up this terrible thing that happened at ICON <laughs> and a convention I've been attending without fail since 1984, I was going to ask you, that dinner that that um, that I never that I've never gone to. Oh, you weren't there. No, I oh. never go to that. For I just my instincts tell me not to go to that dinner. <laughs> no matter what. I, I, I was from out of town. They actually gave me a free pass one year, and I didn't go. Was we that the worst? You. Was that the? I, I hope it wasn't. I wondered where you were. were. You didn't show up. <laughs> I was heartbroken. I your, was, your, your mother and I were very concerned. <laughs> My, <laughs> we almost had the exact same conversation at the New York Comic Con. <laughs> um, I spoke to you before? Yeah. I'm sorry. About my mother. <laughs> oh. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> How is the old lady? <laughs> Not doing good. <laughs> still, still turning tricks? <laughs> All right, um, so. Was that the worst thing that happened that weekend, or was it the airplane? Oh, the airplane. <clears throat> this is great. <laughs> so I make it through Icon Alive. I think, okay, good. And we're in the van going down the freeway, heading back toward the city and the airport. And as we're driving along, I hear a sound like a motorcycle engine and really loud. I'm looking around and don't see anything. And I said to Catherine, Do you see a motorcycle? No, I don't see it. It's really loud. And we see two wheels appearing over the top of the window. <laughs> Never a good sign. <laughs> As a private plane about to land on an emergency and land like 10 feet in front of us, you know, and we'd get out of the way of this thing, you know, and it was just the most astonishing sight. I, the only moment I had that had that same feel to it, some of you aren't going to believe this, but it's true. Um, I was getting a cab back to my home in Los Angeles. <clears throat> we were on the 405 going on to the 101. And I had the strangest feeling come over me. And I said to the driver, be very careful for the next two miles. My death is looking for me. <laughs> and he was still processing this. And about a minute later, two cars in front of us slammed into each other. They, the re comes this way. He jigs that way. Another car goes past us, almost hits us, hits another car. <laughs> and there's this debris. And he's driving like a maniac to avoid the damages. And you know, he says, I'm getting off the freeway, so I think it's a good idea. <laughs> and we get off, and this is a, a driver I used to use a lot. I have never seen him since. <laughs> true story. Absolutely true. I, it was the strangest, like the world closing in kind of moment. And I said, my death is looking for me. And a minute later. Thank you very much. I love your work. I just wanted to thank you. I was one of those lucky people to receive an email from you, and it was a very magic moment. And oh, I thank you. Thank you for that. And you're right. I it, wasn't rude. No, you were. Good. It was wonderful. I'm working on that. It was wonderful. I was I was compelled to write you because of something that happened, and you answered me, and I will always remember the answer. But oh, thank you. I also wanted to ask you one of my favorite scenes in Babylon Five is when Sinclair's girlfriend goes off to survey a planet, and she finds very large creatures that end up attacking her ship. She returns to the station. And she meets Jakar, and she asks, what were they? And he picks up an ant and moves it to another leaf and says, how would the ant explain this to the other ant? I was wondering if you could tell me what your most magical mystery still is. <laughs> the human heart. I cannot figure out the human heart. and probably never will. Um, uh, someone in a Nobel speech said that what's worth writing about, what's worth the, the blood and, and the sweat and the effort, is the human heart in conflict with itself. And whenever I, I look into my own heart, 
I, I, I am baffled you know, by the consistencies and the slipshod workmanship. <laughs> um, and other people. You know, I, 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 am, I am constantly, am, when I meet someone for the first time, it's like encountering a whole new galaxy. And was, where, where, what planet do you come from? You know, what, what, what works inside of you? Because um, I guess the way I grew up, I never really understood people very well. I so I think it's probably part of it. I had moved 17 times. So yeah. you, then you know. And no one you meet had my meaning either. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's, it's, it's the human heart. And, and I imagine right before I die, I'll figure it out. But shit. <laughs> I'll write something really fast. Over here. Hi, Joe. Um, I just wanted to say it's like meeting God for the first time. <laughs> um, if, if, if I were God, I'd have more, more hand or deeper voice. <laughs> um, I'd be English. <laughs> Well done. Well, well played, sir. Excellent. I'm, I am a writer. Um, Throw him down the stairs. <laughs> I've, I've written um, one novel now myself. I haven't bring it with me, but um, brought, brought it with me. I'm sorry. I'm very nervous. Very nervous person. It's okay. I haven't it's smoked just in me. 24 hours. So. I'm less than meets the eye. Um, that's, but anyway, um, I haven't been watching much Babylon 5 lately. It's, it's, it's usually one of my other addictions. Lately, I've been watching a lot of Babylon XXX, which, you know, um, you know, um, puts... Where did that come from? What the um, fuck are you talking about? <laughs> um, so, pussy is on my mind, Joe. Well, there's... There's, there's a great line in um, Abbott and Costello Meet the Wolfman, <laughs> where um, Lon Chaney Jr. is trying to explain his dilemma. He says, every time the, wolf, the, the moon comes out, I turn into a wolf. And, his, and Abbott says, yeah, you and 10 million other guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, so now for the serious questions that I have. Um... You wrote them down? Oh, yes, I wrote them down. Chapter 1. <laughs> <laughs> I am born um, in a small log us, cabin. Most of us know your, your penchant for dark chocolate. Over no, milk chocolate. Milk, 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 milk chocolate. chocolate. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought it was dark chocolate. <laughs> Did you switch opinions? <laughs> nope. He's telling me what kind of chocolate I like. I came 4,000 miles for this. <laughs> um... I know it's 2,500 miles, but by, on United Airlines, it's 4,000, trust me. <laughs> we came by way of Latvia. <laughs> what? What is your question? What is, we are all waiting what here. Is your it's 9,000 hours since we've been here. What is your official favorite food? What is my favorite? You got the line to have my, my favorite food? <laughs> <laughs> my favorite... What kind of tree was I, you know? What would I be if I came back as a tree? I do have a shrink, by the way. I do have a shrink, by the way. She's not very good. So your um, question is, what's my favorite food? Is that what you're saying? If yes, I just audience favorite, people, if your peers. Food, that's my first question. That's your obvious question. You wrote that down. I wrote that down. You wrote that down. <sighs> I'm a burger guy. I like a really good burger. Okay. Are you happy now? So my you've, my, you've, my you've, you've harshed everyone's buzz. My follow-up question to that is: If I were a bird, you follow-up question, would you would you eat me? Would you eat me if I were a bird? Wait. <laughs> His follow-up is Shakespeare once said. <laughs> it's my point of your friend. What do you want to know? Would you eat me if I were a bird? <laughs> And I want an honest answer, Joe. Okay, next. All right. Not next question, next in line. You've had, you've had your time. No, seriously. Um, honest, okay, serious question. 
Babylon 5, Into the Fire. What, what were some of the reasons, um, the fallout between the riot, the, yourself, the actors, the um, producers, whatever was going on? Why, why, was, why did ITF fail? Ultimately? Why did what fail? Babylon 5, Into the Fire. What video about Video game that was being produced with Sierra. Oh, the video game. <laughs> I'm actually representing firstones.com, so... <sighs> I actually don't remember anymore. You don't remember Babylon 5, Into the Fire? Come on. Let's, All right, that's enough. Right, that's enough. enough. All next right. person, please. You have to move on. Next person. Come you have to move on. I'd sterilize that if I were you. I'm, I'm one of those people who have, may have made Delenn female ahead of her time. Um, I actually saw you briefly at Springfield, Massachusetts, at a Was that your house? No, no, no. At, I'm sorry. At, the window was at open. Wish I just... <laughs> at a convention. The blinds were up. You had a really good leather biker jacket. Um, and you showed, you showed a preview of The Gathering that had Mira Furlan's real voice. Mm -hmm. And you said, we haven't done all the post-production. We're going to lower her voice in post-production. That didn't work. And because she had such an unusual accent, because we didn't have all that many Eastern Europeans um, in Hollywood at the time. And she had that fabulous voice. Um, so yeah, you ended up going with everyone saying, she's got a really great voice. Keep her voice. And I. I thought that was a pretty cool idea. Um, and actually, um, my husband and I got married in May of 98. And it's significant only because we were really serious B5 fans. And I had been looking for five months for a Caucasian blonde bride and groom cake topper. And the weekend before, I was like, going out to look for model paint to paint Delenn and Sheridan in our wedding colors because I almost didn't find one. I found one literally the week before the wedding. So you almost got like photographs sent to you of <laughs> Delenn and Sheridan on top of our wedding cake. This question is like a train. Yeah. <laughs> it acquires perspective in the well, distance. The it has a horizon well, line. The, the, the terrible thing is that I was. I got. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope no. I I, right. I don't do burgers. Right. I, I beef You're is not bad. German. Sorry, is, is, beef is, there is there bad a, for is you. Is there a question? Yes, there is. Uh, I started writing what was supposed to have been a short story in November of last year. It is now approximately 180 pages, double space manuscript format, and that's approximately only maybe a half done. And what I thought was going to be a real straightforward story, sort of like not exactly a space opera, but a small space opera. Ma'am, for, for, yep. for the audience, get to your question. OK. They're, they've been cruelly abused by me for the last two and a half hours. They, <laughs> they, they oh, need a break. It could be worse. No, not really. <laughs> OK. Well, it just keeps going my, on. The, the question is that what I thought was going to be simple and straightforward has gotten very detailed mm -hmm. and very complex. No, real. I know. I, I see how, your problem. How do, but how do I edit? How do you end it? Yeah. Besides Stop writing. No. <laughs> I don't think so. Remember what you said at the beginning about the fear of failure? See? The earth explodes and they all die. <laughs> but seriously. I, Ma'am, I, I, not knowing your story, I cannot provide you with an ending. No, um, no, no, that's not. And we're not going to hear it. I can tell you that, but for yeah. sure. No, no. I, what is your technique or what is your method? I know what the ending is before I start. Well, I have that. You have that? Yes. Then get I there. I have two follow-ups. You have two volumes of ending? No, I have two follow-up stories with the same characters. 
Finish the first one first. This is like, when, when, I, was, when I was thinking, this is, on one level, I have no answer for you. I cannot help you out. You're on your own. You have to fight this battle on your own. The flip side is, I've done exactly the same thing you just did. <clears throat> when I was in college, I was having a, a hard time with my own writing. I thought, I will go to someone, as you're going to me right now, for help. So I knew that Harlan Ellison <laughs> had, had, had published his phone number in one of his books, <laughs> foolishly. So I, I thought, I'm going to see if this is a real number. So I called it. And this is the conversation that ensued. Yeah. Uh, mi 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 Mr. <laughs> mi Mr. Ellison, yeah. Uh, my, 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 my name is Joe, and um, I'm, I'm a writer, and I'm having a really hard time right now, and I can't finish my stuff, and my stuff isn't selling more than anything else. My stuff isn't selling, uh, and I don't know why. And what, what would you tell me as help? <coughs> and he said, "Not selling? No. Well, I can fix that right now. Here's why it's not selling. It's shit." <laughs> My advice, stop writing shit. <laughs> th th thank you, Mr. Ellis. <laughs> Years later, we are friends. And over dinner one night, I said, do you remember this conversation from years ago? And he says, yeah, I, I do remember that conversation. Were you offended? I said, had you been wrong, I would have been offended. <laughs> Hi there. Okay. Hi. Um, I completely understand what you mean about, about living and doing what, what scares you. Um, and uh, I just wanted to know, what was your motivation for the original idea for making Dolin transgender? And why do you think that has been so lacking in terms of portrayals of transgender characters on television <clears throat> and in, in films? And are we just not there yet? Or are we, you know, I don't know. I think that, that we're not there yet, and we should be. I, 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 I'm, if we can accept an alien, why can't we accept someone of ours who decides to live in a different way that is more natural to them? So I thought at the time, and Warners was very nervous about this, but they actually said, we'll back you up. Um, let's have a transgendered person on the show. We, you know, and, and look at that issue from the alien perspective. You can do it, you could do it more easily with an alien character than with a human being, you know, with a Minbari rather than one of our species. Um, and that to me seemed like the right way to do it. Um, because again, you have to take chances. This came back to haunt me later on with the Andreas practical joke that I pulled on him. How many of you don't, don't know that story? All right, it's the last long story I want to tell. <clears throat> you all okay? All right. Again, I don't much like public speaking. It scares the shit out of me. Beneath this jacket, schwitzing like you wouldn't believe. Um, and we were at a convention with the audience of like 3,000 people, and I'm to follow Peter and Andreas. And I'm behind the set, and they're talking. I don't hear what they're saying. And I hear the applause. They're done. My turn comes up. They show a big video, which is always my lead-in, because if I suck, the video will, they will like. You know? <laughs> and I walk out on the stage. Silence. Nothing. Not a reaction, not an applaud, not a yoo-hoo, nothing. I mean, maybe they don't know it's me. <laughs> So I say, hi, I'm Joe Straczynski. Nothing. <laughs> Tabula rasa, man, crickets, you would have been heard. You know? And I, I try, immediately JMS leaves the stage and Joe is behind. You know? And I, I flop sweat the whole thing. I'm dying and I try to tell jokes, but silence. Imagine standing before 3,000 silent people. <laughs> and if I have to like 10 minutes of this, Peter leaps up onto the stage and says, this is a joke that you know, Andreas and I cooked up for the audience earlier, and now they can respond now that you've been let in on the joke, so everyone say hi to Joe, and the applause happened. And I turned to Peter and said, you realize, of course, this means war. Because <laughs> I, I, you have to get revenge. That's the first rule, you, you must get revenge, or you'll, you'll never be happy. You know? <laughs> but, but you have to wait. You have to time it just right. You have to let enough time go by. So they'll forget. Not say so you're safe, but 
They'll, they'll kill you regardless, but you got to be, you know, so forget. A month goes by, another month goes by, the Christmas party comes up, Andreas comes up, we chat. This is that thing at the convention. We were all over that, right? Oh, that's long ago. That's ages ago. And, and he says, I'm dead, aren't I? He says, no, you're not dead. <laughs> another month goes by. <clears throat> now I figure I'm safe. Now I can do this. So I write an episode, and here is the subplot. Jakar is in the council room talking to Lita. All of a sudden, he's having a strange pain. He collapses to the ground. And they don't know what's going on. And they move into the emergency room. And they're doing tests on him. And we see the body begin to move beneath the sheet slightly in strange ways. And we learn that among Narns, they can change their gender under stress. <laughs> Cut to Londo's quarters. <laughs> Jakar vanishes, by the way. Cut to Londo's quarters in bed. And he awakens to see someone standing over him. And it's Jakar in female form. <laughs> to say, as a, as a man, I can never forgive you. But as a woman, I can forgive you. <laughs> you conquered my planet but you never conquered me. <laughs> Until now. <laughs> Gives them a big wet kiss. <laughs> Cut away, come back, they're in bed. <laughs> in the afterglow. Lando's saying, uh, are you tired? Not that tired. It goes on from there. So I put the script out. <laughs> now, understand that the crew assumes I'm always legit, and that they know I'll do batshit stuff. <laughs> they remember Delenn. <laughs> so I walk out on the set, and, and the first thing I see is a member of the crew, and this is the part that kills me. Well, she walks over and says, you know, I have, I, thank you. you know. <laughs> I have friends who are transvestites and transgenders, and no one understands. And thank you for bringing this to light. And I feel like an assassin. <laughs> and I go on my way, and the crew begins to move in its ways. And Jerry Doyle comes by the stage, <laughs> having, having gotten the script, says, I happen to be in the area. We were shooting in an old spa tub factory with a gravel pit over here, an orange bang factory over here. There is no here to be around. <laughs> Happened to be in the area. So Joe, I read the script. Very funny. Great gag. It's not a great gag. We're going to shoot it. Even in the Bugs Bunny cartoons, there'd be a, a person in the you know, <laughs> dust where they were standing a moment earlier. Yeah. Boop. <laughs> Yeah. So I go over some, and then I, have, I call on the wardrobe people. So we're going to need to have a wardrobe created for Jakar. <laughs> um, and they're, they're taking notes. They, <laughs> why not? You know? What kind of wardrobe would you like? Same kind of colors as the non colors. What kind of zoptic, you know, and the whole thing. And I bring them in for a fitting. <laughs> <laughs> I call down to the prosthetics department. I want a full chest cast of Andreas, which I have to shave, by the way. <laughs> and it's a brutal process. <laughs> and they say, well, what kind of breast would you like? You want A cup, B cup, C cup, D cup? Well, whatever works with the silhouette. I'm, I'm being very serious. No one knows this is a gag. They all believe Joe is doing this. So Peter shows up end of the day. Happened to be in the area. <laughs> says to me, read the script, great gag. No, we're shooting this. And he says, no, this is, this is revenge for what happened at the convention. And now I use the line I've been sitting on for four months. He says, yes, you're right, it's revenge, but we're still going to shoot it because I don't have time to write that which we are not going to shoot. We're shooting it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Rip. <laughs> I play this out for a week. <laughs> Andreas is chest cast. He comes in for fittings. Peter is sweating bullets. <laughs> the cast are talking on the phone back and forth. He's lost his mind. <laughs> you, we, we have to intercede. <laughs> it's, it's embarrassing. You can't do this. Lost control. So at five days go by, I thought, okay, I put the real script out minus that scene. Walk out, the first person I see is the same crew member I saw on the way in the day when I first put the thing out. She says, I feel so betrayed. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now it's funny. Now Peter comes by, oh, it's, all, it's a great gag and very funny. And, and I haven't heard a word from Andreas in that entire time. <laughs> he has never communicated with me. And about two days later, I saw him in the parking lot. And he walks toward me with something in his hand. And let me see if I can find it here. I can still carry it with me. It is a newspaper article with a picture of me. And it's here somewhere. I'll find it. The article says, it's a picture of me. It says, you know, five years or nothing, says Straczynski. Yeah. Life in space, five years with luck, says creator Straczynski. And he hands this to me. And says, I carried this in my wallet for four years. It's yours now. <laughs> and walks off. And I realize I have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and I still carry it in my wallet, thinking someday I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> and then I'll have a laugh. That's my story. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say, um, even, if, even if the makeup didn't work out, thank you for trying. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Okay. Our last question. Step. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, I wanted to ask about uh, the Harlan Ellison thing um, that you had mentioned that he had uh, kind of berated you early on, but then I think I recall him being orally in the in one of the episodes, um, being very difficult to Garibaldi, and I wanted yeah, he, to know he was sparking the computer. Yeah how, yeah, how did that? How did how did his involvement in the show happen? Did you? I asked him. I was um, going to say, did, your, did, was your fear of calling him up again just sort of like I'm, oh, I'm no, afraid by then of we that? I'm going to call him up and ask him. Oh no! Um, um, after I moved to LA, we became friends uh, while I was working on the Twilight Zone, and um, so when I did Babylon Five, it was no big deal to call him and say you want to help out <coughs> as a consultant on the show and that time to do a voiceover. So he, he's, he's a pal. Um, we get in trouble a lot. He, he gets me in trouble. I, we're at a, a restaurant called Cha Cha Cha, which is um, South American cuisine in Los Angeles. And they had a magician going from table to table. There were about eight of us at the table. And I go, oh, Christ. You know. And Harlan says, what? Says, I hate magicians coming to, and bothering us. We're having a good conversation. I don't want to be interrupted. Want me to take care of it for you, he says. <laughs> If you're ever with Harlan and says to you, want me to take care of it for you, the answer is no. <laughs> Not knowing better, I said, sure. So he gets up and goes to our waitress. He's whispering to her. And she's looking at me. And her eyes are getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> and he comes back. And I said, what did you say to her? It's all taken care of. She goes to the magician, whispers in his ear. He's looking at me. Eyes are getting bigger and bigger. He doesn't come over. Whole dinner never comes to the table. On our way out, I said, Harlan, to know if I can ever come back here again, I need to know what you told them. Well, I said that we were celebrating the fact that you were recently out of prison. <laughs> and that you came from a showbiz family, and your, your father had represented you know, mimes and clowns and, and magicians. And, and that your father was, was killed by a magician <laughs> over a business dispute. And that if he came over, you might, there might be an altercation, and I might be back in prison by the my terms of my parole. <laughs> so, I, I can never go back. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you.